Very welcome to the Education Committee members. Can I ask if we're aware of any apologies? No apologies, thank you. Okay, in terms of chairperson's business then, members, can I seek members' agreement to record the Education Committee's uh, sadness and sincere condolences to the family, friends and school of Noah Donahoe following his recent tragic death? Members agreed? Thank you. Agenda item 2.2 then is the June monitoring. Can I remind members that the Department of Finance has allocated £39 million to the department in support of free school meals, summer activities and childcare? Can I indicate and welcome that the Department of Education has announced a change to the key worker definition, which will hopefully allow all working parents to avail of childcare? And welcome the, uh, that's the Department of Health definition, welcome the allocation of £10.5 million to childcare in the monitoring round, which is presumably to be added uh, to the unspent funds from the childcare support scheme in order to support a new childcare scheme to be launched this month. Members content for the committee to write to the department to see if there are any further details as to how that scheme will be accessed um, and when funds will be made available. Members agreed? Agreed. Is that okay, Clark? Okay. Thank you. Okay, agenda item 2.3 is the ETI report on distance learning. Can I advise members that the Education and Training Inspectorate has recently published a report on distance learning? The clerk helpfully shared a link to this report with members yesterday. This found that there is variation in pupil engagement with remote learning across year groups and schools. Some pupils were reported to have, and I quote, disengaged significantly. There were instances of, quote, as much as half of a year group not submitting work, despite staff following up with letters and phone calls home, end quote. The ETI also reported gaps in learning and differences in progress between children who engaged in remote learning and those who did not. ETI referred particularly to the difficulty in supporting children with special educational needs in literacy and numeracy through blended learning approaches. Can I advise members that the clerk has asked Strambellis University College uh, representatives who are joining us shortly to comment on that ETI report and members may wish to ask related questions of the Education Minister later today. Can I also uh, remind members that we met informally with the National Deaf Children's Society on Monday and seek members' agreement to write to the Department of Education forwarding the National Deaf Children's Society paper, noting the concerns in respect of online and other material produced by schools which does not support deaf children learning and seeking clarity in respect of the use of assistive technology at home and the development of a Northern Ireland wide protocol to support this. Yeah. Members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Can I also seek members agreement to write to the Department of Education in respect of an initial teacher education bursary for teachers of the deaf? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. And to write to the Education Authority, seeking a breakdown of late statements, including the number of deaf children affected, and to ask about the workforce plan for the Teaching for the Deaf service in response to reported planned retirements. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed, thank you. Can I also seek members' agreement to write to the National Deaf Children's Society and ask it to share its research on the impact of statements and of assistive technology, as well as its report on deaf education in Northern Ireland. Agreed? Agreed. Thank sure. you. Thank you. I can also seek uh, members' agreement to also write, uh, or to also invite the National Deaf Children's Society to brief in formal session on the Deaf Works Everywhere campaign. Agreed? Agreed. And finally, seek members agreement to share relevant papers from the National Deaf Children's Society with the Committee for Health. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. 
Okay, members, agenda item three is draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 24th of June 2020 at page six and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Yes. Please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Clark, would you like to speak to matters arising? Um, is that okay? No problem. We're texting Miss Kelly there, so she, yeah. so she's joined us. Right, no uh, problem. Chair, um, what we have in our matters arising is a revised version of the survey, um, which we were to send, we did a great send to, uh, it was uh, teachers in post-primary, um, uh, sorry, teachers in primary school, and sorry, I'm talking rubbish now. You're okay. I'll begin again. Um, it's a survey. It's about the 11 plus. It's sorry, it's about post primary transfer in the context of um, COVID. It was designed to determine the, um, the views of parents and perhaps their children around um, the preparations for post primary transfer, um, sort of in the current context and more generally. I think the idea was that we would have that survey and then there would be another one for teachers, maybe time a bit later, because this is not a great time to ask teachers any sort of difficult questions because they're preparing uh, for the end of the year. Um, and that, um, oh, as I say, we'd follow that uh, survey up to parents and young people with a survey for teachers, maybe around September time. But um, what I'd suggest, Chair, is that because time has made those of us, we've managed to get to the end of the session, which is quite surprising. Um, what I would suggest we do is uh, take on board the suggested changes um, that have been tabled, the members are happy to do that, and then maybe defer this to uh, when we meet again in August, and then at that time send out maybe three surveys, which would be quite similar, one for um, parents, uh, one for children, and another one for teachers, just on this subject of post-primary transfer, Covid context, which may well have altered by then, uh, and, uh, and you know, the general question of uh, to say who's primary transfer chairperson. Thank, thanks, Clark. I, I think those are all helpful suggestions. Can I throw a spanner in the works and and suggest that we might be able to attempt yeah. uh, agreement on that and and expeditious action of that next Wednesday. Um, is, even if we attempt it, Clark, and if, if indeed it proves uh, a bridge too far and, a, and too short a time period to turn it around, then we can revert to the suggested time scales. Our me members will have in their packs, just to supplement the helpful guidance that we have received from the clerk, a, a cover note from the clerk at page 13, a revised draft version of an online survey at page 14, suggested revisions to the survey at page three um, and a proposed um, way ahead there from the clerk in terms of uh, deferring consideration until we meet again in, in August with a, an approach of a, a parent-child survey and a teacher yeah. survey uh, to be promoted. But I, my, my only request is that we might um, endeavour to consider those in a way that we might be able to agree uh, in a bit more detail next week and perhaps giving us an opportunity to have some type of survey in July and August to just be slightly concerned that if we wait to August that the time scale on this may be slightly too delayed. Members wish to come in? Daniel? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm just, well, I'm conscious, first of all, you've said that we're going to look at this beyond today, but there's just some things in this uh, survey that concern me, things that don't make sense. For instance, if you look at question nine, um, fourth so additional... Just, Daniel, just to remind then, the, the online survey is at page 14 of our packs. Clark, is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, Daniel, go ahead. The, the, the fourth additional question doesn't make sense. Schools only use admissions criteria when they are oversubscribed. Un, undersubscribed schools don't need to apply them. Is that what that means? Apply them? Yeah. Is this in the survey or the proposed changes to the survey? This is the proposed changes to the survey. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm not brain dead. It's from last night, but it's, a, it's the it's question nine. proposed changes. Yeah, something that makes sense. Sorry. Uh, okay. And then. What the member's referring to. Is he in the table pack or the meeting pack? That's in the table pack. Okay. okay. So 
There is no question nine, so I'm not, not quite sure. Question nine is in the pack. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of confused. Okay. Sorry, uh, uh, is it, sorry uh, down here. It's, it's the fourth additional question. It doesn't make sense. Fourth additional question in table packs. Question, which was the additional questions? All right. Okay. I see what you're saying. Okay. Uh, so yep. within. Okay. I've got you now, Daniel. So on um, page three of table pack uh, online survey amendments, uh, there is a, a on the second page of that. So actually on page four of table amendments, there is suggested additional questions. And the, the not numbered, but the fourth additional question: Should all post-primary schools be required to use the same criteria to decide which pupils to admit if they have more applications than places? Yeah, I, I, I guess so. It's it's, it's asking um, should the the quite criteria used um, to decide which pupils to admit if there is oversubscription be required to be the same in all schools. At the moment, obviously, boards of governors have discretion to determine um, what criteria they use, albeit with due regard to the recommended criteria by the Department of Education. So it's, it's, a, it's a variant on the question before that, I guess, Daniel, which says, should all schools be required to use the same admissions criteria? In full stop, uh, this is the same admissions criteria if there is oversubscription. Does that make sense? Daniel? Well, here I'm suggesting we, we take a week uh, to review these uh, suggested mm -hmm. questions um, and see if it's possible to agree the survey next week with a view to um, publishing it over the summer. Uh, as it stands, if we wait until August, then obviously the, the schedule rolls on quite significantly. No, I agree that we shouldn't wait to August, Chair. I think we do need to address it, but so just uh, some of the some of the things that just don't make sense. If schools are undersubscribed, there's no need for criteria, I'm assuming, so it just it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But okay. there's another point. Uh, another thing identified is the, the rationale behind singling out uh, the six criteria for post-primary schools over and above all the other schools. Just what, what rationale do you use for that? Uh, where where is that one again, Daniel, sir? That's um, page four. I think he's on page four. What? What? It's the, it's, it's the four, six four. criteria that's proposed for post for post primary schools over yeah. and above all the schools. The criteria the other schools use. So it, it doesn't. You know, I'm just wondering what the rationale is for the use of that. For the the admissions criteria. Yeah. That that admissions criteria is the Department of Edu is the recommended Department of Education admissions criteria. That's why it doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, he, he, have have a have a review of those, and by all means, um, consider yeah. whether or not they can be included in the actual survey. But uh, as I said, I think we should take at least another week to consider some of those, and indeed, if we find um, some of them are not suitable, then. We can absolutely say so. And Chair, sure, sure, I'll I'll, uh, I'll draft up a few of the things that I have and then send them over, sure, and then we can just okay. send them over to you. Obviously, yeah. next week is is our our final opportunity to have an agreed survey that could be released during the summer prior to uh, the start, effectively the start of next term. So, um, if if members are content to give that due consideration between now. And next Wednesday, and I, I, as the clerk has reminded us previously, uh, ideally, um, any new additions and suggestions, given that it is the last um, Wednesday for consideration, would need to be with them by Thursday, ideally, clerk. Yeah. Um, I think if sooner than that would be better, because okay. if you want me to read, what I would like to do is just redesign the questionnaire if okay. I possibly could. Um, also, members, uh, usually the last meeting of the session is kind of action packed. So we'll need to set aside time for this then to talk about it. I would also just reiterate, I really don't think it's a good idea to try and promote a survey about education over the summer in Northern Ireland. I think the stakeholders uh, will have a lot to say about that. Uh, whereas if you wait to September, it'll be different. They'll, they'll be in a frame of mind, but also just previous experience. Um, uh, the stakeholders get very 
very touchy about things being launched over the summer, but I'll leave that with the committee, okay? So no, deferring that, that, consideration that, then? Yeah, no, that, they're all fair, fair comments. Um, so members content uh, to uh, forward any suggestions to the Clark ASAP really today um, after our committee. Um, and sure. Yes, who's that? Yeah, it's Robbie. Go ahead, Robbie. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank, uh, thank Peter for the work on it. I think it's a, it's a really important piece of work we, that we do. I'm just forward, probably for Peter, for pulling this together for next week. Slightly difficult, and I think Daniel was, fell foul of it there, it's difficult to look at the, the example that has been put together and then to go to table pack and, you know, in a separate document and, and be on Starleaf and do three different things and, and talk about the same the same issue. Um, is there any way of just pulling that together? Because I had issues with questions four, five, six, and seven, but they were addressed in the table pack well, the summit. Um, so it's just about so we look at the same link, the same thing, to so know what, where the changes are being promoted and stuff, or are put forward as, as potential changes. So as, as the chair has indicated, if members send me, cause this is this is tabled information that the chair said to me about a day ago, um, so okay. that if members will send me what changes they want now or, or very soon, I'll then work that into a questionnaire. I think it's going to be more than one questionnaire because this is now focused at a couple of different groups. So um, so if you can send me something, then I can put something in the pack. There's only one thing to look at, and then you can say yay or nay uh, when you have it in front of you. Fair enough. Right. Thank you. Fair enough. Okay, members, thank you. Content. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, members move to agenda item five then, uh, our uh, Stramlands University College oral briefing on distance and online learning. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep me in the spotlight function, remove all of other members and add witnesses, Dr. Noel Purdy, Dr. Bruna McKee, Dr. Glenda Walsh and Ms. Celia O'Hagan and keep them there for the duration of the briefing. Can I also ask members to note in your meeting packs a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 18, a briefing paper from Stramillis University College at page 23, and a copy of the report on its recent online survey of homeschooling at page 47. Can I confirm that we have the following uh, on Starleaf with us this morning, Dr. Noel Purdy, Director of the Centre for Research in Educational Underachievement at Stranmillis University College, Dr. Bruna McKee, Senior Lecturer and the Child Protection and Safeguarding Coordinator at Stranmillis University College, Dr. Glenda Walsh, Head of Early Years Education at Stranmillis University College, and Ms. Celia O'Hagan, Senior Lecturer in Professional Learning and Teacher Education at Stranmillis University College. Everyone with us there, they are indeed. By way of welcome, can I uh, say that during lockdown, uh, those of us with school age children and uh, right across Northern Ireland have transformed our homes into offices and classrooms, and we've done our best to manage new technology and new rules. The department's guidance to schools appears to indicate a somewhat greater role than usual will be required going forward for distance or blended learning and this seems to mean continued use of more online materials and software. The recent ETI survey shows a concerning variation in online engagement and it's therefore extremely timely to have uh, experts from Stramillis University College to advise the committee on the state of play and the issues of concern in this regard. I warmly welcome the team from Stramillis today and would invite you to make some opening remarks for perhaps 10 to 15 minutes followed by questions from members. No, Noah, would you like to make a start? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Chair, uh, members of the Committee for Education and uh, colleagues. Um, and thank you for the invitation to come along today to discuss the challenges associated with provided, pr providing blended learning provision as part of the Restart Programme for Education, including online safety considerations for pupils. Um, you will have received our written, inf our written evidence, which I'll refer to in a moment. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself and my three colleagues uh, from Stranmanus University College. So my, my name is Dr. Noel Purdy. Uh, I'm Director of Research and Scholarship and Head of Education Studies at Stranmanus, where I'm also Director of the Centre for Research and Educational Underachievement, a centre which has led a major parental survey on homeschooling experiences during lockdown and also produced a series of blogs over recent weeks uh, covering related issues and concerns 
as we prepare for the educational restart. Dr. Glenda Walsh is Head of Early Years Education at Stromalis. She's a leading expert in the field of play and playful pedagogies in early childhood and primary education. Glenda has been involved in many major research projects, such as the Longitudinal Evaluation of the Early Years Enriched Curriculum Project in Northern Ireland. And she also headed a major project on examining pedagogy in early childhood education for the Department of Education in the Republic. Dr. Walsh led the team that carried out the homeschooling survey for us and has written about early years considerations during the restart. Dr. Bruno McKee is a senior lecturer and the Child Protection and Safeguarding Coordinator at Strand Manus, where she also chairs the Child Protection and Safeguarding Committee. Bruna is an early year specialist with a background in social work. She lectures at undergraduate and postgraduate level on childhood trauma, adverse childhood experiences and adverse community environments, trauma-informed practice and early intervention and prevention. And finally, Ms. Celia O'Hagan is a senior lecturer in professional learning and teacher education at Stremilis. She also leads the college's mission for widening participation and coordinates the college's online master of teaching provision for in-service professionals and learning leaders. Celia has worked within professional teacher education for over 20 years. During this time, she's led many online and blended learning courses, including the recent heavily oversubscribed professional development course for teachers on remote teaching and learning. By way of, of brief opening remarks, I would refer members to the written evidence where we have structured our considerations into four sections, um, each one led by a member of the team based on our respective areas of expertise and relevant to the subject matter today. So in order and going through the written evidence, these are first of all, uh, technology enhanced learning and blended learning post COVID-19 and that was led by Celia O'Hagan. Secondly, uh, challenges in relation to safeguarding practice including online safety and a blended learning approach. My colleague, Dr. Bruno McKee, has led on that. Uh, thirdly, early years curriculum and pedagogy, led by Dr. Glenda Walsh. And finally, um, acknowledging and bridging uh, the learning gap, uh, led by myself. The current COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in most children and young people learning at home in Northern Ireland since the 23rd of March. And actually in the case of special schools, it was really a week earlier than that. A range of research studies in Northern Ireland um, and elsewhere in, in the UK, including our own, indicate that experiences of homeschooling have varied considerably due to differential uh, family circumstances, including um, internet access, ownership of appropriate internet capable devices, parental employment status and work patterns, parental confidence and ability to actively support home learning, quality and quantity of learning resources provided by schools, children's special educational needs, lack of individual differentiated learning support, and challenges in providing pastoral support to facilitate mental health and well-being among pupils. The foremost concern for the restart in August, September must of course be the pastoral care and well-being of our children and young people, um, and, and indeed the workforce. Different pupils within the same class will have had very different experiences of the lockdown period. They will also have varying levels of coping skills and resilience in dealing with those experiences. Greater awareness of those experiences, as well as existing adversities and how children are coping will be very important. Physical safety is of course important, but relationships are key and essential to help children rebuild resilience and connections. Children will struggle to learn uh, when they do not feel safe. Therefore, there's an urgent need for school staff to ensure that children are not only physically safe upon their return, but that they are emotionally safe as well. In the early years in particular, the importance of adopting a playful approach is acknowledged as central to providing therapeutic opportunities for socialization, interaction with peers, communication, and the expression of emotions, while making maximum use of the natural and outdoor learning environment as a safe extension of the indoor classroom space. While prioritizing the physical and emotional well-being of pupils, there's also a need to provide appropriate, differentiated and targeted learning support for those children who were unable to learn effectively since uh, the 23rd of March. Some of this can be achieved through whole class differentiated teaching, but it's likely that additional one-to-one -one or small group time will also be required in some cases to ensure that no child is left behind and that the lockdown learning gap is bridged effectively. 
In all cases, children need to be provided with encouragement, support, and reassurance. During this time, and with very little time to prepare, teachers have faced considerable pressures to adapt to remote uh, teaching and learning, necessitating unparalleled shifts in modes of delivery and significant upskilling in the use of digital learning platforms, tools, and apps, such as Collaborate Ultra, Google Classroom, Seesaw, and Microsoft Teams. Upskilling and supporting all teachers to develop a quality child-centered pedagogy is therefore a key priority within a blended learning approach in August, September. Finally, following uh, communication yesterday, uh, members of the team have uh, taken a quick look at the ETI reports on remote and blended learning, curricular challenges and approaches. Um, obviously, we have had very little time to read those in detail, but we welcome those reports. We appreciate the engagement with the reference groups which have led to those reports. And we acknowledge actually that the findings there correspond very closely to many of our own findings and other recent research. Chair, we're very happy now to take your questions uh, on all four of us in our respective areas. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Noel. Um, we're extremely grateful for uh, access to your expertise today and for all the work that you're all doing in, in those um, various extremely important fields. Um, could I, could I maybe start with just a very, hopefully very straightforward question and ask you, um, what is blended learning? Uh, I'm going to pass this to Celia. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, thank you, Noel. Um, uh, it's, it's an interesting question, question Chair, and it's one that uh, is coming to the fore even more in uh, recent months. Um, blended learning is effectively uh, what it says. It's this idea of blending learning in terms of a hybrid approach. And so it's a percentage of contact with uh, pupils or learners that is face to face. Um, so uh, obviously we're alluding to the fact that we are returning to school. And even if we have uh, in this unfortunate situation that we're in uh, a part timetable, there will be a percentage uh, required of support online as well as the face to face modality. So effectively, it is a hybrid uh, contact with pupils and teachers. OK, thank you. And what is the current extent of the continued professional development and training available for teachers in blended learning? Are you happy? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, colleagues. Um, well, currently, as you know, and as you've heard from uh, Noel this morning, and indeed from ETI colleagues in the most recent report uh, just yesterday, uh, there is a variety of approaches uh, being taken by our schools in Northern Ireland. And so subsequently, there is uh, a move, uh, and it's a, a welcome to move, uh, from a 100% remote or homeschooling uh, perspective to what we would call, from a research point of view, a blended learning uh, perspective. Uh, sadly, the uh, contact with students has been jeopardized. Uh, teachers have not had sufficient planning, as we all know, uh, to enter into this lockdown period. And subsequently, uh, the blend of learning is something that is emerging as opposed to something that we've seen uh, coherently planned. So would that be, be fair to say that it has presented a, a significant challenge to teachers? And we, we recognise the endeavour with which they've attempted to respond to that challenge, yeah? Uh, that's absolutely right. Um, the, the schools need, needed, therefore, uh, more time to sufficiently plan for what we would call uh, robust blended learning or a quality uh, approach to this. Uh, they have done their best, obviously, and we commend our teachers in Northern Ireland, and I know that all colleagues would join in, in that applause. However, uh, the, the lack of planning and, of course, the lack of uh, CPD for teachers entering into this uh, era uh, in terms of even a definition, as we've started today, of blended learning or technology enhanced learning as we return to school, um, that definition has been floundering as opposed to something that is uh, clear for all schools. 
uh, it's good news that effectively it is emerging, uh, but there is still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, I suppose to try and get to the heart of the question uh, regards the extent of the training uh, available to teachers in blended learning. Um, obviously, Stramos University College has um, delivered uh, an extremely helpful CPD course in remote teaching and learning, but how, how many teachers would have been able to complete that course at this stage, and are you aware of any um, substantive <coughs> plans from the Department of Education to upscale the training available to teachers for blended learning? Okay, well, the course chair at Strandmillish University College was offered as a response at a time of crisis in Northern Ireland, and we did receive almost 1,000 practitioners um, interest in the course. Um, of course, we uh, as part of our social corporate responsibility at that time. Um, we have now uh, worked with almost 400 uh, practitioners across all sectors um, who have fully engaged with the online programme of learning uh, offered to date. We also have more uh, cohorts of interest emerging for the August and September period and working with many of the stakeholders that have been mentioned indeed today including uh, education authority uh, advisors and of course uh, those who are working with uh, are hardest to reach uh, young people in Northern Ireland including those with difficulties. Um, so we are reaching out uh, currently and of course that interest is emerging uh, fast and furious. After working with these practitioners in the course however um, there remains a challenging time and it's a, a challenge in terms of CPD uh, and it's also a challenge in terms of clarification of definitions um, and policies around how we will take these things forward. I am aware of uh, significant training from C2K uh, colleagues in areas of uh, what we would call e-tools, uh, so some of the packages and applications that uh, my colleague Noel has advised members of today, uh, platforms like Collaborate Ultra for live lessons, uh, platforms like uh, Google Classroom and the Google Suite and of course Microsoft Teams uh, and other platforms that are emerging of interest. Um, there is an element of demand in these areas and a, a significant contribution of time given from schools in upskilling in these tools. Uh, I suppose the main thing we would recommend uh, in our evidence presented to colleagues today is that a quality approach is taken to this and so post-crisis there is an opportunity to address this challenge uh, in terms of uh, quality pedagogy for blended learning and when we're 100% back at school, um, a technology enhanced learning as opposed to just crisis um, band aiding. We'd be, we'd be really eager to stay in contact with you in, in relation to this. Um, as, as we mentioned, some form of, of blended learning, uh, at least in contingency, is going to be required and indeed um, perhaps uh, positively included in uh, approaches to learning going forward. But final question for me before I bring members in. Obviously, technology enhanced learning requires access to technology. Um, what, what ICT, what is, what, what's your assessment of the extent to which uh, teachers have adequate access to the ICT equipment that would be that is necessary to be able to deliver that technology enhanced learning I, I'm, I've, I've received reports that t teachers um, do not have adequate access to technology to be able to uh, deliver that learning but be interested to hear your, your views on that the main challenge uh, chair seems to be around uh, access as opposed to whether the technology and the tools are there um, and so I do link the uh, demand that seems to have emerged to both our particularly rural Wi-Fi challenges, which we have all experienced, no doubt, um, and also uh, access policies within uh, schools themselves for uh, interactivity and tools to support that, like, for example, laptops. Um, I do understand that there is a recommendation that we continue to use certain platforms However, uh, having worked with uh, almost 400 practitioners, uh, many of them very new to technology enhanced learning and indeed remote teaching at that time from mid-March, um, 
I have come to realize that uh, the infrastructure in terms of things like Google Classroom that's been mentioned and indeed uh, Collaborate Ultra uh, doesn't just require CPD, that is, is very much uh, at the core of the problem, but it does require support in terms of its appropriateness for all of the uh, ways in which teachers will choose to use this technology. So uh, these are free tools at the current time that any citizen has access to. And uh, often you will find that the more extensive virtual learning environments, uh, platforms such as Canvas that we ourselves and Queen's University use in Northern Ireland and many of our FE colleges will use, uh, platforms like Blackboard um, and, and many, many others exist. Um, so uh, sadly, uh, schools don't have access to some of these very interactive platforms. They're using free tools available through Google Classroom and of course uh, applications uh, appropriate to that. Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much indeed. See a significant challenge there and I think our, um, if we are going to uh, require blended learning from our, our teachers uh, and indeed our pupils, we've got a significant amount of work to do to equip them to be able to, to use that approach. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Can I bring in uh, Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA? Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, everyone, for attending the committee this morning, but also for your hard work and your report. Um, the, it's very much welcome, and the findings will be vital, uh, vitally important for the restart program and, and going forward. Um, very much as you described there, the education system was three under this. Uh, we didn't have time to plan, um, uh, so uh, it's fair, I suppose, wearing both hats as a parent as well. Um, uh, what has been in the past term can't be what it, it is going to be going forward in September. Um, we're very much aware of that. So it's about us all working together um, uh, and coming up with solutions and all that. And very much yourselves have done that. Um, and I thank you for it. And it's going to be of great use to us all. We already knew that those who were uh, most disadvantaged would be the most disadvantaged, and that very clearly comes out in your report for quite a number of reasons. Um, poverty, household incomes down during COVID, many children wouldn't have had parental support, access to devices, um, or printer or connected to the internet. Um, and it was interesting to see the, 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 the levels within, within the survey because in March in the chamber, I had uh, raised this with the education minister, particularly very early on in relation to even access to a device, um, internet and the home and, and, and printer. Uh, that has now been looked at and been rectified, but it was very slow in coming. So again, come September, you know, we need every child connected up. We need teachers um, trained, confident and doing online learning and support. Um, and it was good to see the, the high level of interest in, in your own training. Um, but with all, all of the learning um, that is lost, which uh, is very concerning, I would be more concerned at this stage, but ensuring that our young people's mental health um, and mental health and emotional health is, is very much factored in. So I really welcome that in your recommendations, uh, that would be number one is prioritising pastoral care, health and wellbeing for young people. Um, do you think that the department would need to set pastoral care in, in, uh, as guidance, as well as all the other areas that they're working on at the minute? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Deputy Chair. Maybe I'll, I'll start on that one. Um, yes, first of all, in relation to um, in relation to disadvantage and disadvantaged um, children, that was a very much a, a finding from our report. I suppose our report highlighted, uh, above all, the, the wide disparity in experiences um, during lockdown. This was a parental survey with over 2,000 uh, responses by parents. Um, and, and I think probably that, that one of the major findings was that um, homeschooling has not been the same for every family, for every parent, for every child. Um, a minority of families have uh, really enjoyed and thrived uh, during lockdown. And we had uh, quite a few responses in the survey um, of 
book, you know, um, outlining uh, wonderful experiences of, of parents spending more time with their children, um, particularly parents who were um, qualified, educationally well qualified, feeling confident in the delivery of, of lessons at home and supporting, but actually actively tutoring uh, their children at home, children who were uh, less stressed and contented. And we had that beautiful weather, if you remember, at the start of lockdown and children and parents were able to enjoy being outside in the garden and nature walks and so on. And you had almost this idyllic uh, picture of, of what uh, family learning might might look like. But that contrasted quite considerably uh, with the experience of many other uh, parents, uh, and in particular, um, parents who were essential workers or key workers, uh, who were often working long hours, longer even than, than usual, uh, and struggling to um, find time and energy uh, to devote to homeschooling. Um, in the middle, there were a lot of other parents who were working from home um, and trying to juggle uh, work commitments and online Zoom calls like, like this, uh, while also trying to uh, manage homeschooling. Uh, and uh, many parents felt uh, overwhelmed, very stressed, uh, exhausted, burnt out uh, by the whole experience. We did ask, of course, around uh, questions around access, and we did find still um, parents. Of course, this was an online survey, so uh, you know the, the disadvantage of doing an online survey is that only those with online connectivity are going to respond to this. Um, but even the parents who did respond were saying that that they didn't have a device per child. And there was lots of sharing going on. Uh, some children were having to try to um, access resources from a mobile phone, which is extremely difficult. Um, a quarter of our, our parents in the survey said that they didn't have printers. Uh, and yet a lot of the material is still being, being sent out um, uh, to be printed, you know, worksheets to be printed and completed in that way. Um, and yes, there, w there were issues around internet connectivity, and particularly in rural areas, uh, where teachers as well as uh, children, of course, are going to struggle to access resources. So we feel very strongly, and it came through very strongly from our report, that there were uh, inequalities. There are, of course, already inequalities in society and in our education system. But the, uh, the experience of homeschooling, which has gone on for over three months, um, is likely to exacerbate those inequalities. Um, to move on to the second part of your, your comment, Deputy Chair, um, we all as a, a, as a team feel very strongly that um, we need to prioritize uh, the emotional health and, and uh, well-being of our uh, children and young people in the restart. Um, yes, I, I do think that the Department of Education needs to prioritize pastoral care, but I'd have to say that in the guidance that's come out around curricular planning, and of course there have been a raft of, of guidance documents coming out from DE in the last um, few weeks. But in the one around pastoral or in, around pa curricular planning, um, you know, it's very evident there that, um, that officials in the department are prioritizing the mental health and well-being of our children and young people, and that there is an awareness that, that yes, we do need to address um, learning gaps and, and children who have not progressed adequately over the last um, three months. But there is already there in the documentation and the guidance for schools uh, a very clear message uh, that that uh, should not be the priority, that the priority has to be reintroducing children into the formal school environment, re-establishing routines and, and prioritizing their mental health. Only then, uh, you know, going back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, only then can you think about uh, readiness to learn and having children who will be in a in a position to be able to engage actively and positively with learning. Um, my colleague, Bruna McKee, uh, I'm sure will, will want to add uh, to my initial remarks on this, Bruna. Uh, good morning, everyone. I had problems with sound earlier, so I'm just checking that uh, it's okay now. All good, Bruna, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, well, yes, I just uh, totally agree with what Noel has said there, that um, pastoral care is absolutely crucial. It must be a priority. And I was delighted to see that it has been referred to in um, both the circulars on uh, remote learning, but also curriculum planning, um, and of course, the ETI reports. Um, I think teachers have done absolutely fantastic over the last few months. Um, pastoral care is not easy at best of times, but to be able to engage in pastoral care remotely 
has been acknowledged as one of their biggest difficulties. So I think first and foremost, we need to acknowledge how well they have done. I think they have done um, a superb job at trying to keep children safe because um, everybody knows, teachers more so than anybody, know, they know that children will not learn if they don't feel safe. They will not learn if they are not in a safe environment. And we have had far too many children have been um, slipping through safety nets. Um, that's not my terminology, but uh, there, there's a real need for teachers to recognize that children are going to come back in September um, having faced multiple adversities. Mm -hmm. Some of them will have been facing these adversities prior to the lockdown, and then the lockdown will have exacerbated the impact that these adversities will have had on their emotional health and well-being. So if there's any additional training or guidance or direction that can be offered to support teachers in the very solid role that they're already doing, um, I, I would be very you know that would be very welcome um, to see that happening. Uh, the Safeguarding Board, for example, is rolling out lots of trauma-informed practice training. Um, we already provide the ACE awareness and trauma-informed practice training at Stranmillis with our student teachers. Um, but I do think there are ongoing challenges in relation to helping to build the capacity of teachers to meet these multiple adversities that children will have been uh, facing in recent months. That's Deputy Chair, if there's, if there's time, I think it would be good to bring in um, Dr. Glenda Walsh as well on this one in yeah. terms of um, providing the early years perspective. Yeah, Glenda. Oh. Glenda, she be. She must have dropped out. Must have dropped out. She's there. Uh, <coughs> must have No, I think. Oh, maybe Glenda has dropped out temporarily. Um, no. But, but if, That's Glenda yeah. there. Glenda, can you hear us? Yep, that's her there now. I was emailing her. She can't get her camera working, so maybe. Okay, we'll we can on. we can try and bring her back in uh, after this question. No, if that's okay. Okay, I think Celia wanted to come in as well. Actually, no problem. Yeah, I mean, if if I could just uh, uh, reiterate, I suppose to a certain extent, what my colleagues have already said about the importance of both safeguarding and, of course, pastoral care. <coughs> Um, and th this will inevitably help staff in schools to clarify, uh, going back to uh, the focus of a restart and of course to understand a range of methods that will highlight the value of what they're about to venture into, which is a world of synchronicity and asynchronicity that is fairly new to many, if not all. Um, we must also remember the fears of staff um, at this time. And of course, to relay these fears among members of the teaching community and validate the importance of the live lesson. We've seen in the report at Stranmillis, uh, parents have called for more live lessons and we are going to have uh, blended learning or remote teaching for a period of time for at least some learners. Uh, but even where we have a part time table, uh, we need to support our staff uh, across Northern Ireland schools in order to uh, address this. Uh, but very importantly, if we are going to go forward with a blended learning approach, it is vital that teachers feel secure in this environment. And to do that, we have to secure uh, the closure of the classroom doors virtually. Um, we are used as members of the teaching community to our classroom door physically closing. And so there is this sense of who else can see and hear us in this virtual world. So we have to give them that security. And we also have to ensure that the lesson is cyber safe. Um, we've seen many of the tools uh, jeopardised at this time, and of course, we don't want our teachers uh, fearful of that. I've been dealing with that uh, uh, recently with some of the Zoom technology that many of our colleagues have trialled. And of course, as we know, Zoom has had a security breach uh, in the past uh, few months. So teachers need to feel secure as well, and it's uh, a welcomed addition. Yeah. And, okay. and finally, could I say one more thing? And that is, and, and I, you know, and this is very much in our uh, report. It's very much in what um, Glenda Walsh has written about in, in blogs, and very much in the curricular planning document from DE as well. That particularly for young children, but arguably for all all children, when when we come back, there's a, a real need to prioritise social interaction, collaboration, creativity, opportunities for play. Um, interestingly, one of the ETI uh, reports that we read yesterday talked about screen saturation. Well, I think we're all probably suffering from screen saturation. 
um, during lockdown and it recommended no more than two hours a day uh, for eight to 11 year olds. And I, I read that with great interest. Uh, for younger children, of course, we would be saying much less screen time than that. Uh, so I think there are, are, are um, there's a major priority really coming back to encourage children to get back to socializing. I mean, many young children, if they haven't got siblings, particularly in the house, have really been quite isolated in terms of social interaction with their peers over the last three months. So prioritizing that, um, providing opportunities, safe opportunities face to, for face-to-face -face interaction, socialization, you know, learning to share, learning to play, learning through play, all those opportunities are, are vitally important when we go back. Yes, we do need to address you know, issues around attainment and children who, who have not been learning uh, as effectively as others during the last three months, but, but really our priorities have got to be uh, in terms of the socialization, social skills, mental health and well-being um, of our children. That's, that's far more important. Okay. Uh, folks, uh, I'm going to come in here just to remind us, I think we have uh, a little over 30 minutes left. Um, we genuinely could discuss these issues within significantly more detail um, with you. Uh, witnesses, your, your expertise is um, greatly welcomed. Um, if I could encourage members and, and our witnesses to, to be as concise as possible, given the, the time restrictions on us today, and by all means, we'll seek to follow this work and contact up with you. Uh, Karen, are you content for me to move on? Yeah, Chair. Thank, uh, th thank you, Karen. Today. We've talked about it all day. Thank you so much um, for all of that. It's great, thanks. Thank you, Karen. Robin Newton? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, can I thank Noel, Brona, Glenda and Celia. Um, this is an extremely interesting uh, report. I will be succinct, Chair. Um, can I just refer to one part where the studies appear to suggest that very few teachers have engaged in live lessons using the internet owing to poor access and reliability issues for the relevant platforms and also owing to limited teacher knowledge of technical requirements and about how to design online lessons. And indeed, Chair, I think that uh, it seems that from what has been said this morning that the Strand Manus recommends the prioritising of pastoral care and well-being uh, and so on. Uh, and it seems that from what Noel said in particular, I think that there is a sync between what this report is saying and what the Department of Education uh, have been sending out uh, to as guidance. But can I just ask the question, Chair, in the maybe the next step down the line, what is the what are the implications for today's situation uh, in terms of the overall training of, of teachers? Uh, at Strandmanus College uh, for the incoming year and, and subsequent years. Given that I think we are in a very changing situation, that we're not going back to where we were uh, of a few years ago. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, thanks, Rob. Um, thanks, Robin. I'll maybe um, kick off with that one. Uh, well, clearly, yes, uh, there has been a. Um, a a major um, shift in, in teaching and learning um, since March that has you know, catapulted every teacher in Northern Ireland into uh, remote teaching and learning that, that nobody could have predicted even six months ago, uh, let alone several years ago. And, and yes, of course, in relation to um, your question, Robin, uh, there will be implications uh, not just for uh, serving teachers, for in-service teachers and professional development, but of course for initial teacher education as well. You know, looking ahead, um, and for initial teacher educators, of course, like ourselves, um, where we're, we're all moving to um, a blended learning approach um, or remote learning in, in at least the semester ahead, if not the year ahead. And I think clearly there are implications for us in initial teacher education as well, that we will be um, looking at our, our courses, making sure that our teachers, are, our, our student teachers are adequately prepared for the eventuality that this could reoccur. But also, you know, let's, let's not pretend that we're going to go back to how things were um, before March. You know, even though we will have more face-to-face -face and hopefully return to full-time um, schooling, there are lots of advantages, which we've all discovered, I think, through remote technologies over the last um, a few months 
and I'm sure they will have enduring uh, implications and consequences, many very positive consequences for how we do education, how we do teaching and learning um, in schools, even when pupils are back uh, full time. I see uh, my colleague, Dr. Glenda Walsh, has, has joined me again. So, so I'll, 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 I'll hand over to Glenda if, if we can be here, because Glenda uh, leads our um, early years PGCE program at Stromalis. Yes, thank goodness I've got the camera working now and hopefully the sound as well. So apologies for that. I don't know what was the uh, was causing the issue. So yes, um, I head up the PGCE at Stranmolish University College. And um, as we have only um, uh, 15 students within our PGCE early years, we intend to, to bring the students back on campus as much as we possibly can in a safe way through social distancing. Um, we also uh, endeavour to make use of the outdoors as much as possible, because if we are um, uh, advocating that the outdoors should be used in our early years settings, we also then want to encourage our actual um, student teachers to engage in outdoor learning as well on our beautiful campus. So we hope that the, the weather will be kind to us initially in some shape or form, but we'll all be investing in um, uh, uh, warm coats in that respect and going outdoors to um, to use um, the materials in our outdoor environment as well. So um, the majority of our teaching for our early years PGCE will be done on campus as much as possible from September. There will be the issue of placements, of course, and we certainly will have to work with um, the schools in that respect. We are hopeful. We have been in touch with quite a number of our nursery principals, um, which is the first placement for our PGCE. And, um, and we are hopeful that we'll be able to gain 15 places. The students might have to travel a little further than what they're used to in that respect. But um, if that is not possible and another spike were to occur, well, we would have to um, work around those things and be creative in our thinking and make use of remote learning as much as possible. But we are optimistic that things will go ahead and that we will be able to have face-to-face um, -face teaching and our placements as, um, as normal. Um, Celia, I think, wants to add something as well. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, we have a module uh, which we have extended through our social corporate responsibility, uh, which is uh, dedicated completely to blended learning and technology enhanced learning. Um, and so that program of training is available to all teachers in Northern Ireland currently. And um, so we have seen the flurry uh, over this uh, crisis period. And of course, uh, we have had a waiting list uh, to come to Stranmalis online. Uh, the complete study program is supported through the experience of being an online student themselves, which is vitally important uh, to this new pedagogy. Um, alongside that, we of course have had a huge amount of EGCE students are currently studying that module with us as part of their um, graduation uh, period. And of course, uh, we're very welcoming of those students. <clears throat> Pardon me. We have as well in the college uh, some professional learning modules, uh, which we are looking at uh, alongside some of my colleagues uh, for initial teacher education. And of course, the opportunity to extend that to your undergraduate uh, student teachers uh, at the college is now something that is uh, uh, of particular focus for us. Um, many of our uh, program coordinators, primary, post-primary, um, are working alongside us to look at the potential uh, for that uh, to uh, integrate. Uh, so, for example, in September, uh, there will be a module uh, that is offered to many of our student teachers online. Uh, so, as we are integrating back to college life, as Glenda has said, uh, we do envisage some online programs uh, to support uh, blended learning and, of course, this new uh, evolving concept of technology enhanced learning for schools in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Okay, that sounds very busy days for Stradmullis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Uh, can I bring in Daniel McCrossan? Uh, can you all hear me okay? You can indeed. Go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, thank you to our guests today for sharing uh, the very important information and figures that they have shared. Uh, Dr. Purdy, we, we, I cited uh, your report yesterday and my contribution in the Assembly because I think that it provides for some 
very important reading in terms of the statistics and numbers and how children are being affected. Uh, in fact, in listening to you uh, to this morning, it's almost like listening back to my own speech yesterday because it played a, a very important role in the contribution that I made to the Assembly in relation to these important matters. Uh, I want to commend you uh, on the, uh, uh, um, the important initiative that you have taken to upskill 400 teachers in blended learning, and I'm delighted to hear that further training opportunities are in the pipeline. I think that's vitally important. Uh, uh, particularly in the times that we're in. I'm also pleased to hear, and I know this has been touched on by, pre by other members, but pleased to hear that you have surveyed various parents. Um, and my concern was that those who wouldn't have access to devices, uh, and I know you've touched on this, uh, would, would, their, their views wouldn't have been reflected in the survey, but I know Dr. Purdy and your colleagues, you have, you have touched on that already. Um, and, I, and I thank you for that. It is a worrying situation indeed, and we strongly put that to the Minister yesterday. You've stated that very few teachers have engaged in live lessons uh, dur uh, using the internet, owing to poor access and reliability issues for the relevant platforms, and also owing to limited teacher knowledge of technical requirements and about how to design online lessons. What implications does these findings have for the current C2K system and its successor? And what would you what would be needed uh, by way of technology, infrastructure, hardware, and training to enable more live interaction with teachers and a better all round digital learning experience for our children? Okay, um, thank you, uh, Daniel. I um, kick off, and then I'll pass over to perhaps Celia in, in just a moment. But first of all, um, I'm delighted that that you found our report and our research useful. And I think one of our, our key aims in the research centre at Stromilis is to make our research uh, relevant and also accessible. So uh, that's exactly what we want to hear, that, that MLAs like yourself have access to our research and, and, and find it relevant uh, to practice as well. Um, in terms of, of um, live access, um, what we found in our survey was um, that, that there, there were examples, uh, of course, of teachers uh, who were connecting remotely uh, through live video. Now, we fully appreciate that there are um, concerns, that teachers have, have concerns about um, live teaching, and uh, teaching unions have expressed concerns about that, and we fully appreciate that. Um, what parents were saying, I think, in our survey uh, very strongly was that their children were missing um, a sort of visual um, interaction uh, with mm -hmm. their peers, but also with their teachers, particularly parents of younger children were saying that they're their children really miss their teachers, and there, there's, there are lots of positives in this story as well. You know, they miss their peers, they miss their teachers, they wanted to see them. Uh, putting, putting worksheet after worksheet up on Google Classroom is not the same as seeing yeah. their teacher. And yeah. uh, so, you know, in our report, we were careful in terms of our recommendations. We fully appreciate the challenges of, of live um, interaction with young children and the, the, the concerns that teachers might have around that. Um, so there are opportunities for uh, pre-recording of messages, and parents were not being unreasonable here. I know, I know there's been some criticism of teachers, and we're not going to do that. Uh, teachers have been working extremely hard, often homeschooling themselves, of course, during this crisis. Parents weren't saying that they wanted live teaching all day. They were saying, could we have five or ten minutes or a, a quick message from the teacher to the pupils, even once a week, to say hello and it, you know, just to check in with them and to see that friendly, familiar face, the teacher that they had grown to love over the course of the year. Uh, so that level of, of interaction is something which can, can grow. And what I would say is that our survey, of course, was done probably quite early on in the, in the lockdown period. And I think actually teachers have grown in confidence and expertise during this, this process, during this crisis. There have been lots of uh, teachers who have upskilled themselves. And we've had organizations, um, grassroots um, bodies like, like Blended NI, who have uh, been formed uh, over the last few weeks and have um, shared expertise and run webinars and, and really helped to develop uh, teachers' confidence in this, in this area. I'm going to pass on to Celia in terms of the C2K and sort of hardware questions now. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the question as well. I think it's a very important uh, point that you're making in the question. Um, clearly, the need to upskill and support teachers and leaders in Northern Ireland to advance a quality pedagogy if we really want uh, quality technology enhanced learning and blended learning uh, to uh, 
per pertain in this area, and I would suggest that is the opportunity, as Noel and colleagues have shared. Uh, I'm not for one minute suggesting that all learning should take place in front of a screen, uh, as my colleagues have said. Uh, technology enhanced learning and blended learning is not always about sitting uh, online, and the use of technology and blended learning allows for active learning and, of course, deeper thinking, metacognition, uh, which, which, when used well, will have better results. Uh, so mixed media can support playful learning, it can support outdoor learning, and of course it can transform uh, that indoor and outdoor classroom and that blended learning classroom in the future. Um, the challenge, of course, is that each school or college will require a robust champion team, and that is something that we need to support, that's something we need to professionally develop, and of course uh, it will take time. Uh, we need to offer the time and space for professional development and professional learning in this era if we really want to transform uh, the future for technology enhanced learning and blended learning. And the question about uh, the learner management systems and softwares and applications that we use currently, uh, there's no criticism of any technology tools that are out there. We've made the best of the resources we have available to us. However, uh, in our experience, and the research would back this up, that virtual learning uh, environments uh, must be robust. And of course, uh, many of the free uh, tools that are available that schools in Northern Ireland have access to because they are free um, are not giving the entire functionality that our teachers will want. I myself on the course, for example, uh, work with uh, those teachers week to week to ask them to critique these platforms and I compare and contrast platforms. And of course, they are studying with me on a virtual learning environment, Canvas, one of the best uh, platforms available at this time. Um, so this higher education experience that they've had illuminates the opportunities and shows them that the free functional software that's out there is perhaps not the best that we have. Um, so if there was something I would call for, it is maybe a reflection on that question, point nine uh, in my recommendations within the evidence submitted. Uh, is there room for a robust strategy uh, using a virtual learning environment which integrates all the necessary components of technology enhanced learning and blended learning now and in the future? Okay, I think Daniel has dropped off momentarily. Um, perhaps I can bring Robbie Butler in at that point and I'll bring Daniel back in if uh, necessary. Robbie? Thank you, Chair. I see the spotlight is flashing on me, so I believe you can hear and see me. Guys, thank you for your report. Uh, incredibly timely. Uh, and uh, why I say that is from the very start of this crisis, I've had serious concerns about online learning. Blended learning wasn't the terminology that we were using. We didn't understand, but that's obviously the, the term that has been given to it. And I suppose, and this is no criticism of anybody, we need to do what we need to do at this moment in time. Um, the chair will have been at a meeting, I think, when, when Stormont was first coming back, and it was with uh, the Microsoft team, and they were looking at what technology could be used to do in the future. If we were to look at technology and use it, look at online learning and say, where does this fit into our curriculum, and where does this benefit all our pupils, our teachers, our stakeholders? And unfortunately, what we've been faced with is looking at the technology that is available to us and having to thrust it upon parents, teachers, um, the pupils, and, and everybody else, and, and I do believe we're, we're doing the very best we can, but this report has picked out some shortcomings um, that are probably unavoidable at this point, given that the teachers, as you've pointed out, perhaps haven't had the opportunity to train to deliver the packages. We have a, a variance in pupils' ability either to learn through online learning, to print off documents, the, the discrepancy in parental ability to support, whether that's through time or ability. And we haven't really touched on the special education needs stuff, which has been picked up in your report, which I have looked through. Um, this committee um, has a real focus in this this term on that mental health and wellbeing piece. And I want to thank Noah for picking that out at the very start, the pastoral care and wellbeing piece. But I do know that you just did a bit on special education needs. So I am only going to ask one question, guys. And it's, it's in and around... Um, ADHD, autism, and profound learning difficulties. And now, so this isn't necessarily negative. I, I'm just wondering, looking to see in terms of your report so far, 
and it has been alluded to that there are some good points of this and in certain instances it may be useful to develop further in the curriculum now so i'm going to be honest i'm not a big fan of this of a blended learning approach uh for for the wider curriculum going forward because i think we classrooms are always going to be the best place if we can facilitate children in the classroom that social piece and that face to face where the teachers can pick up on those uh, unspoken cues um but i accept that there may be real value uh, in this as a tool going forward can anybody sort of speak about that please particularly with regard to children with adhd autism and profound learning difficulties okay well again i'll maybe kick off and then i'll i'll, I'll throw it open to my colleagues to come in here um so thanks very much, um, Robbie, and um, you're absolutely right. I mean, this has been thrust on um, all of us, um, all teachers, parents, children in Northern Ireland, and I do think that, that we've coped um, very well under the circumstances of a, a global health pand pandemic. And let, let's not forget that, that, that children have been experiencing something that none of us have experienced whenever we were children. Um, I'll talk maybe briefly about special educational needs, if I may. Um, I have an interest in special educational needs. I'm a governor of a special school and a parent governor of a special school. Um, and I think that the key point to make here is that it's very hard to generalize that the very term special educational needs is a vast mm -hmm. uh, term uh, covering an enormous breadth of ability, disability, strength and need. Um, and so even even talking about, um, as some people do, you know, SEN children, you know, I always like to talk about children with SEN rather than SEN children. So children with SEN is an enormously broad uh, grouping. We're all familiar with we're talking about the autism spectrum, but actually the spectrum of special educational needs itself is even more broad, of course, than the very spectrum of, of ASD, which is only one, one grouping within that. And so the impact that, that lockdown has had on children with special educational needs does vary considerably um, among children, depending on their particular needs and um, challenges that they might have. Depends on um, things like, as you've mentioned, um, home support and uh, support networks uh, and so on. Um, and even in our report, and it wasn't a major focus of, of our um, survey report, but clearly there were quite a number of parents who did refer to this. And uh, the picture was very mixed. So there were quite a number of parents who were, of course, um, expressing um, concern and anxiety. And um, this has received a lot of media attention. Um, you know, parents who are at their wits end, really, with uh, children with very challenging behaviors. And of course, all the support networks were removed almost overnight for those parents, not just in terms of school, but in terms of respite care and therapeutic interventions and everything was just removed overnight. So of course, uh, many children struggled with that and the parents, um, of course, as well. Um, and I'm delighted uh, that now, you know, there's been guidance put out from the Department of Education around the restart for special schools and, and summer schemes and so on. And all of that, of course, is to be welcomed. Um, there were, though, as you um, suggest, also some parents who actually said that their children with special educational needs were really thriving in the home environment. Uh, and uh, some of them, uh, I'm sure not all, some of them were children with ASD and ADHD who actually were really enjoying uh, being at home, uh, who were enjoying the less stressful, busy, uh, uh, less um, um, sort of populated environment of the home. Um, some of these children really struggle with the socialization and the, the unpredictability of school environments and so on. So there are some children definitely who have benefited from, with special needs who have benefited from being at home and their parents were actually expressing concern that, that their children might struggle with being reintegrated um, mm -hmm. into the school environment. Of course, many children with autism in particular uh, love routine and they find it difficult. Any sort of upset to, to a routine can be really quite um, uh, detrimental to their well-being for, for uh, the, the short term. So for those children who have now adapted to being at home, for them to adapt again to going back into school is going to take uh, some time. And I know special schools, but also mainstream schools are very conscious of that. So I suppose in, in, in short, then, in relation to special educational needs, it's very hard to generalize. Uh, there are children with uh, severe learning difficulties, with profound and uh, multiple learning difficulties, as you suggest, who have really struggled. But there are others who have actually adapted quite well to being at home. On saying that, 
may I share what you're saying? And, and as a parent myself, I'm looking forward to schools being open again in September. Uh, you know, we, we, we are still very strong supporters of, of you know, schooling, and we believe that children learn more effectively uh, in school. Um, but some children, it has to be acknowledged, that some children with special education needs, albeit a minority, have actually uh, really benefited uh, from the, the safe, I suppose, cocooned and predictable home environment. Um, I'm going to throw it open to colleagues. I'm sure others will want to come in. Celia? No, Noel, I'm, I'm going to have to cut us down in terms of our, our, our time scales here slightly. So if, if Celia wants to uh, offer a very concise response, I'm really going to have to reduce our our question time and our yeah, answer apologies. times. I'm really sorry about this. And, and absolutely, we can return to these matters with you when, when possible to do so. Celia, would you like okay. to comment briefly? I'll be very brief, yeah. I mean, uh, just in response to uh, our colleague, technology-enhanced learning, uh, I purposely put into the addendum for you as a definition because uh, we at Stramulus, of course, believe in the warm-hearted teacher and the warm-hearted teaching environment first and foremost. So uh, blended learning or online uh, pedagogy is certainly no replacement for that. Uh, that said, uh, my recommendations are that we ask our pupils uh, as Noel has said, many will have different perspectives on this, including those with special educational needs. Uh, I have myself worked as a homeschooler uh, and supported some special educational needs, so I understand, as other colleagues will, uh, some of the challenges around that. So focus on the learners, what works for them. Uh, they have experienced this crisis, and they will certainly know what didn't work. Um, uh, many of us as parents, of course, as well as teachers, will know uh, what didn't work as well. Uh, there are some of those voices unheard currently, and I, I would strongly recommend you listen to those voices. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, William Humphrey? William dropped out. William it? dropped out. Okay. Uh, is da Daniel, would you like to supplement your question or your answer very briefly? Yeah. Like you're back yeah. with us, yeah? Uh, Thank you, Chair. There's a classic example, folks, of the connection issues in Tyrone, and I am very concerned for all the children in Tyrone because this is an example of the situation that we're up against, and uh, it's a big issue. I, I caught some of the answer to the question that I had asked, but I am very concerned in relation to C2K specifically. As you'll all know, C2K hasn't faced any renewals since 2017 and hasn't uh, received the necessary uh, upgrades that would align them uh, or prepare them for whatever other infrastructure that would be required to accommodate children and schools in this particular situation. Uh, I, I've raised it continually with many, and I don't seem to be getting uh, the answers that that that, uh, that, that that it should be. C2K is a big issue. I think most people recognise that. Uh, I have a genuine con uh, concern that come September, when the demand increases on that system, that it will not be able to sustain the level of demand and will crash out just as I did in the middle of your answer. So that's the, that's the concern I have. CDK is a big issue. I'm just wondering if you have any comments on that because it's a major concern in relation to uh, blended learning in relation to homeschooling as well. Okay, so is C2K capable of meeting the demand that uh, blended learning could place upon it? No. Uh, I'm gonna pass to Celia um, okay. to comment on this one. Yeah, I mean, I'm, no, I'm not a technology expert, I'm a teacher first. I would call myself somebody who's interested in educational technology, um, so technology second. So I wouldn't uh, in any way want to uh, uh, suggest that I'm given an expert opinion on that. All I can say from an evidential point of view is that the 400 teachers that have been working with us to date, um, and indeed the services, Education Authority are working with us as well, uh, we have experienced and they have experienced some difficulties uh, within uh, their uh, remote access uh, opportunities for uh, functionality. Um, and that has included uh, access through some of the C2K platforms. Um, now, uh, that said, I've worked myself with our C2K colleagues, uh, and they are readily available to scaffold and support all teachers. Um, we've made referrals where there's been uh, some troubleshooting, and they've been instantaneous almost in responding, and we commend them for that. So I think everybody is working uh, to maximum capacity to support this crisis. Um, and I would accept uh, what Daniel has said in relation to the challenges uh, perceived, at least at this point, 
uh, that perhaps will come to the fore. My strong recommendation, if it is of use to you, and I'm not a technology expert, is that a virtual learning environment is required in Northern Ireland. Okay. Yeah. Daniel, maybe, maybe that's, you mean, maybe that's you something to raise with the department as well then, yeah. Can you, can you bring yeah. your question to a close? Thanks. This is something that we, we have continually raised with the department. We don't seem to be getting much clarity on it, and I appreciate absolutely uh, what you've shared with us today. I think the report, uh, Noel, that uh, has been compiled by yourselves has been invaluable in shining a very bright light on some of the real issues that uh, exist at present, and I certainly found it very useful uh, 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 in relation to these issues. I'm just concerned that children will fall between the stools, will be left behind because of these most simple of issues that should have been and could have been addressed in an earlier stage. Uh, we don't know what lies ahead. We don't know if there's going to be a spike. Uh, and I would hope that the Department of Education would listen to people like yourselves to ensure that we are ready uh, to step up when required to ensure no child is left behind. And that's my concern overall, particularly in rural constituencies such as West Tyrone, where there's many who have no access to sufficient broadband provision. And then obviously you have children who live in more impoverished backgrounds. Uh, and social deprivation being a big issue in some of these rural communities as well. But thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'm sorry I I, 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 uh, I went out there, but I don't no, know what happened to the system. Th thanks for your points, your questions and your points, Daniel. And there are issues that we will absolutely want to pri prioritise and return to. Can I bring in Catherine Kelly? Thanks, Chair, and thank you all for your presentation today and for all your work at this hugely challenging time. My question is in relation to early years. How do you think our childcare practitioners and in particular our preschool leaders can ensure blended learning for preschoolers? And what would that actually look like? Um, and just I'll, I'll just ask another, include another couple because I know we're tight in time. Has there been any discussion around training for childcare practitioners? Um, and if there is, how can they access that? Um, Glenda? Okay. Um, yes, just in foremost, um, just the question with regard to the blended learning. Um, I would say very much the evidence is very much pointing to the fact that um, we don't want our young children sitting in front of a screen for the most part of the day, um, completing worksheets online. And that's definitely what we want to guard against. And um, so it's very much um, a short live session by the early years practitioner practitioner in terms of pointing to um, play related activities that can be done in a sense of skilling the parents to some extent as to how they can support play in the home environment and then allowing children to engage in active play with their parents either indoors or outdoors so that's very much what's needed and um, and it's very much what um, comes to the fore within the evidence base. We want our children learning, young children learning practically. And um, so if they cannot be in the school context, then it's essential that we upskill parents to enable them to do it outdoors through the medium of the early years practitioners themselves. In terms of professional development courses, well, there have been a lot of professional development courses available to early years practitioners through shared education on the power of playful learning and practice. Now, those have been ongoing from really 2017 and have been um, wild, widely available by early years practitioners, both within foundation stage classes, early years um, um, classes, and to some extent play groups as well. So um, we do provide a hub facility within Stranmillish University College as well in terms of going around settings and sharing expertise with them. And again, um, a, those courses will become available through a blended facility um, from September onwards. So we hope to support our early years practitioners as much as possible in terms of providing high quality playful learning experience in the school environment and if the school environment or the early year setting environment is not going to be fully available to our young children then at a blended facility through upskilling parents to enable them to deliver play uh, playful learning activities in the home thanks thanks for that Glenda. Um, and just just one other question um are you concerned about the short period there is left to ensure that everything is in place um, as we know, September isn't too far away. Um, and how much engage engagement have you all had with the department um, on all aspects of restart? 
But do you want me to continue, Noel, or are you coming yeah, in there? No, Glenda, you start, yeah. Well, simply just to say that I have great faith in our teachers in that respect. I think we have um, a, um, some uh, very creative thinkers out there, and I know by being on a number of Board of Governors that they've been working um, very hard over the last few months to try and get things ready for the end of August, September, um, to encourage as many children back in school as possible because our children need to be back in school um, as much as they possibly can. And um, so I know that um, they have been um, thinking of ways of creating a, a safe space in school and then supporting then um, children when they are at home through that blended facility. So I do realize that there is just a number of weeks um, ahead, but it's just, it, they have been working hard already and it, it's building on that experience. And um, uh, I do think we have to be optimistic to some extent as well. I think in a, a, a crisis such as we have been experiencing, it's easy to become very pessimistic about things. And I think we have to realise that uh, try to be as creative as possible to ensure um, ways in which we can get our children back into um, our early year settings and schools again as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, training for parents, um, important point. Um, okay, can I bring in Justin McNulty? Good morning, um, Rona, Noel, Glenda, and Celia. Very, very interesting research, very, very um, thought-provoking piece of work and um, really, really enjoyed reading it and really, really have enjoyed your presentation thus, thus far this morning. Just on the, the survey, um, I found a few startling pieces of data in that survey. Um, 2,035 people surveyed on your online survey and 95.4% um, of the respondents were female. <laughs> Can you explain that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can explain it, but uh, it, it, it probably uh, reflects uh, the reality of, uh, uh, of childcare and um, educational supervision in, in many homes. Um, I'm not sure if any of my female colleagues would like to comment further on that. <laughs> well. Yes, I would just agree with what Noel says. Um, it says in many respects is very reflective um, of homes in Northern Ireland where um, the mother tends to be and very much tends to be the person who engages in the, uh, the, the education to some extent with the, the young children in particular. And, um, and for that reason, probably they were the ones that decided to complete the survey. Interesting piece of data, don't you think? Fathers need to step up a bit more in terms of their children's <laughs> education, wouldn't you say? Yeah, very much so. I, I can respond to that one as a, as a man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Justin, I, I completely agree with you. And I, and I noticed that when the survey, even before it closed, that the figures were, were very, very low for, for males who had completed the survey and, um, and didn't really get much higher towards the end. So, yeah, I, f I fully agree. Um, and 70, how, how reflective is that survey data, given that 70% of the respondents had a university degree? How does that reflect society in general? Well, I don't think it's too far off. Um, I mean, I, I think it is positively skewed towards those who, of course, have got internet connectivity, and we've said that at the start, um, and um, is probably slightly higher than the, the Northern Ireland percent in terms of university qualifications as well. Um, but there was a, f a broad cross-section in that survey as well. So there were, um, we asked about educational qualification, not just the degree level, but you'll see as well in the statistics that, that there were a number of, of parents who responded with no qualifications or those who had left school at maybe 16 with GCSEs or left school at 18 with, with uh, just, um, you know, uh, A-levels or equivalent qualifications. So there was a spread there, um, um, but... You know, given the circumstances, as I said at the start, it simply wasn't possible at, at the, in those early days of lockdown to go out and interview people uh, on the street. So that wouldn't have been deemed to be uh, essential business to go out in the street and, and, and find other parents. But um, we did try our best in terms of circulating it to some community groups as well so that we could try and get a broader cross-section of the population 
um, but we were constrained, I think, by circumstances as everybody else was at that time. Yeah, another just uh, stat there, interesting stat was 76.3% of children engaged in homeschooling five days a week. So um, what about the other 23%? What's happening? Um, yeah, I think uh, what we found was that um, the children of parents who were um, more highly educated were more likely to spend longer uh, on homeschooling. So if you look at that, we break that down further on in the report as well. Uh, and that is actually supported by other research that was carried out in England as well um, by the Sutton Trust. So more highly educated parents are more likely to spend longer with their children um, in homeschooling, and that's reflected there as well. So, um, you know, those who weren't being educated or homeschooling five days a week were usually engaging four or three days a week. I mean, there were very few who were doing less than that, Justin. Okay. Very important uh, point noted in the report was SPCC's um, school service have raised that's concerns that many children have been left to suffer in silence during this pandemic. What's what's your perspective on that? So that's very, very, uh, it's heartbreaking to read that. What's your perspective on that and how that's going to impact the, those children's education? Rona. Um, yes, Justin, it's a very good point to make and it's certainly something that um, worries me greatly. Um, speaking to very many colleagues, social workers, um, you know, across Northern Ireland and various trusts, have all raised the same concern that during the lockdown, uh, particularly children who, for example, are already on a child protection register or they're already um, involved in intervention services. And um, those services have had to stop for many children. And um, they have not had their one-to-one -one counseling service with their, their social worker or their therapist. Um, teachers have not been able to pick up on concerns that they might have seen um, in everyday classroom practice. So there, there is going to be, um, we believe, a large uh, group of professionals are very concerned that come September, um, that there will be a large number of children will start to appear, for the want of a better word, um, and there will be an urgent need to support um, the, the safety needs of these children. But if if there is another spike, um, those children may well remain hidden, and it could be some time, um, and, and that would be a massive concern. Yes, it would. Okay. And to what extent do you believe uh, education is linking in with social services to try to address that issue? And that's a very, very important issue. It's a very sad and shocking issue. What, what, is, what is happening to proactively address that issue on the ground now? Uh, well, in terms of practitioners, um, a lot of the interprofessional education webinars um, are trying to address that, and that's where they're bringing um, teachers, uh, health professionals, as well as social workers, so that they can learn with each other, but also from each other and about each other, um, rather than just being told what the other professional um, role would entail. So it's about raising the awareness of what the other professionals are doing and what they can do, but also supporting teachers, um, signposting them, making sure they know exactly who's available in their area and what supports will be available for children that they might have any concerns about. Um, it's going to be hugely challenging and um, there's no getting away from that but I think the there is a massive need for more communication between the different professional groups and certainly with our student teachers and our early childhood study students we do um, link in with social work students as part of their training so that they hopefully will have a better idea of um, the importance of working together and um, even though even though they do have their own professional um, cats Okay, thanks, Ronnie. But the learning piece is only one piece of it. The fact that some children are not, are not safe in their own homes, that's just horrendous. And I think we all have a role and a duty to play in terms of addressing that. And I hope that you're offering your support to the, the bodies that they can make an impact there and make a positive impact because it's just it's not acceptable. The last thing I want to say is very quickly, uh, you've mentioned the importance of outdoor learning. And I love that from, from Glenda. Um, uh, and that's really important for the your early years. Can that be moved up the scale for not just the early years and also the impact of uh, physical activity and learning and how is that being melded into to help improve uh, educational achievement? Well, yes, I argue strongly that um, outdoor learning uh, can be moved beyond the early years. Um, a, very much so. As I've said earlier, we are trying to make use of outdoor learning for our um, PGCE students 
So likewise, it can be used, if it can be used with young children and used with graduates, it certainly can be used throughout the whole um, uh, throughout the whole spectrum in many respects. And I would be encouraging um, schools to avail of outdoor learning uh, as much as they possibly can, as we do um, move toward, towards the new restart in September. Um, we do know that the evidence base is very much saying that it's um, it's much healthier for children to be outdoors, um, not only in terms of physical activity, but also with the result of the whole COVID-19 um, crisis. Um, the the uh, medical experts tell us that when children are outdoors or when any of us are outdoors in many respects, um, that is more de difficult to, to, to catch this thing. And um, so it's making use of the outdoors that we very much um, uh, emphasise that. Can you just remind me what your second question then is in with regard to outdoor learning? Physical, physical activity, physical activity, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on the mental health implications of the lockdown. What, what are the positive um, role that the positive role that physical activity can play in children's education? Yes, um, yes, and I think um, within the, the, the evidence that we submitted, I referred to um, some research evidence that showcased the fact that um, even during the outdoor um, lockdown period, um, a, the fact that we had some um, wonderful sunshine and some wonderful weather, uh, parents did avail of the outdoors much more fully, and, and children really enjoyed that experience and learned from it in terms of going out and perhaps uh, if they did have a garden, playing in the garden uh, and going for short walks together um, uh, just to uh, spend that time together was very nurturing and very um, uh, worthwhile for the children and the parents in many respects. And so um, I have heard some degree of caution from school with regard to um, physical activity as the whole restart programme begins again and um, that uh, perhaps changing rooms will not be able to avail be availed of but then uh, and perhaps the amount of um, PE activity will be reduced to some extent. But again, I would be encouraging, and again, the evidence is suggesting that we could bring the children outdoors and therefore that um, physical activity could be undertaken more fully in the outdoors than within gyms, etc., within school. One final question, guys. Um, homeschooling for essential workers. What's your perspective? Well, that was um, one of the big messages that came through our survey, wasn't it? That um, um, essential workers were probably the, the single group who um, uh, felt most under pressure in the circumstances of lockdown, uh, working longer hours and trying to juggle um, home commitments as well. I mean, what they were calling for, I suppose, was um, some uh, understanding from um, their employers on the one hand, and also uh, more developed childcare um, facilities um, which could be um, freely accessible or at least at a reduced cost for them uh, and therefore we welcome this this allocation um, announced yesterday of, of ten and a half million pounds uh, towards childcare that's going to be I think probably from a parental perspective a uh, major challenge in the autumn um, during lockdown of course there were major challenges at home but as as parents are being um, brought back from furlough and into the workplace more and more Childcare um, is is a major major issue. That's that's probably the biggest concern that, that parents have in terms of the practicalities of August and September. The other thing, of course, is when we talk about um, staggered start times and schools having perhaps two days on and three days off, or one day on and one day off, and so on. It's the sheer practicalities uh, for parents like myself, actually, with children at, at, at different schools um, next year, trying to navigate through that um, labyrinth of complexity of, of which child is at school on which day and what times they're pick up and start time. I, I appreciate that this is not a, a default of schools, but there are real practical challenges here. And if childcare can be developed um, more effectively with this um, additional funding allocation, I think that will certainly go some way to alleviating the pressure on parents. Okay, thanks Noel. Thanks, no, thank you very much, Grace. Thank you. Thank you. All right. so, Noel. No. No, I'm, I'm going to need to bring us to a close. Noel, I just have one final question um, I want to ask you. Um, choose to answer however you wish. Is it appropriate to test 10 and 11-year-old pupils in November and December 2020 for admission to post-primary school in 2021? So an easy one to finish off with then, uh, Chris. 
Um, well, that's, that was, uh, what I would say is that that was a concern that was raised by the parents of P6 children um, in our survey. Uh, of course, that was fairly early on in lockdown. They were expressing concern of the uncertainty at that moment, uh, whether the test would actually go ahead or not. Uh, they were concerned in some cases that their child could be left behind because they weren't able to devote uh, enough time or didn't feel confident enough to support them at home. And of course, uh, this is a very complex issue. There is evidence uh, from our review of the um, existing research uh, that we published in January that confirms, as you know, that, that children from disadvantaged backgrounds are less likely to attend grammar schools. And um, there is the potential, the likelihood that disadvantaged pupils are going to fall further behind during this lockdown um, and will have less um, access to support from parents and less access to private tutoring to help them to catch up. So there is, of course, um, all of, of those arguments on, on, on the one side. On the other hand, of course, um, uh, you know, this is an issue for boards of governors and grammar schools uh, to deliberate on and to uh, make decisions on. Some we have seen in, in recent days and weeks have taken the decision to suspend academic selection for this year, although generally in geographical areas where all of the, say, Catholic grammar schools have decided to work together in this. So, I mean, clearly there are big challenges here for children. Um, uh, I'm a parent of a, a child in P6 myself at the moment who is facing uh, testing in the autumn. Uh, and my concerns would be um, about the actual, um, you know, who's asking the, the children themselves uh, about their, their experiences. And if we do um, suspend the tests, and of course TCSE and, and A-Level have managed to work on, on a system of predicted grades, but not AQE and GL. But if we do suspend them, then we need to make sure that whatever replaces them in terms of admissions criteria are um, fair and equitable and don't actually replace um, uh, one system with another inequitable system. So, um, you know, clearly this is a concern. It's a concern for parents. It's a concern that was voiced in our study. And, uh, and yes, of course, I, I, um, I share that concern uh, as a parent uh, looking ahead to the next few months. Okay, I appreciate that answer. Thank you, Noel. Noel, uh, Brona, Glenda, Celia, sincere thanks for your time and expertise this morning. I, I genuinely uh, hope that we'll be able to maintain that work in contact with you as many of these challenges um, are going to remain for some time and it's important that we work together to respond positively to them. So thank you very much indeed for, for all the work that you're doing at this time. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, we'll move to our, our next uh, evidence session for today then with the Youth Work Alliance and Irish Medium uh, Youth Sector. I uh, have cover in from the clerk, page 146, Youth Work Alliance Briefing Paper, page 153, Irish Medium Youth Sector Briefing Paper, page 160, copy of EA Funding Scheme for Regional and Local Voluntary Youth Organisations, at page 162, EA Report on Irish Medium Youth Work, at page 209, Revised Regional Youth Development Plan, page 254. Priorities for Youth Document, page 290. Can I confirm that we have Mary Field, CEO of the Youth Work Alliance, Professor Sam McCready, Chairperson of the Youth Work Alliance, uh, and our representatives also uh, from uh, Forum No Oak and Gore Namuna are with us as well. Is that right? Maybe we turn down the screen a bit. If somebody is dialing in, if they can turn down your sound. <coughs> can you turn down your sound, Professor McCready, on your computer? No, oh, social distancing. Okay. Uh, is that any better? Is that any better? Just to turn it down a little bit further. Good morning, Chris. Yes, I'm here. Um, I think um, we're getting feedback from two laptops. Okay. <coughs> Maybe if you turn down the sound a wee bit more. Still getting it. That seems to. Yep. Seems, seems to, to address it. the problem. <laughs> Is that any better? Hold on. 
I think Mary's moving, so we'll, okay. we'll give her a minute. Okay. Just bear with us. Uh, we're getting a tour of, of your house, I think. So. <laughs> Okay, apologies. Can you okay. hear me now? Yes, that, that seems to have uh, addressed the, the, the problem. Um, we're delighted okay. to have... No, no problem. We're delighted to have all our, our, our representatives with us um, today. Uh, youth work, uh, sector and youth services has been a priority for the committee. Um, we really look forward to hearing from um, all our representatives today. Um, can I suggest that we begin with uh, Aoife and Orla? Uh, in relation to the um, Irish medium youth sector. Thank you, and um, thank you for having us today. Uh, I'm Ethan McCallum, and I'm uh, sorry, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Can, we, can you guys uh, increase your sound uh, slightly or, or speak as loud and clearly as, as possible? Thank you very much. He hasn't been here. Is that loud enough? Yes, that, thank you. Great, okay. So I'm Aoife Nicallum and I am presenting you today on behalf of Forum the Nogue. Uh, Forum the Nogue was established as the lead representative organisation for the Irish Medium Youth Sector here in the North in 2009. And we work on behalf of Irish Medium Youth Clubs, their committees, staff and volunteers and young people themselves. And it's the main of Forum the Nogue to strengthen and develop these clubs. So we began in 2009 with two clubs. And 11 years on, and our sector has grown immensely, supporting a total of 35 clubs through the years. And all of these clubs provide youth provision to young Irish speakers, supporting the ever growing Irish medium education sector, which now provides almost 7,000 young people and a number that's expected to rise significantly. Our sector has been based exclusively on the affirmative action from the review of the Irish medium education recommendation uh, 18 specifically to provide informal learning opportunities for young Irish speakers which is also echoed in priorities for youth. The implementation of the Education Authority's Irish Medium Scheme played a vital role in this growth allowing developing groups to access up to 5,000 annually which contributed to the programme and staff costs. This scheme which has kept our sector alive will no longer exist in the new funding scheme. Hello, um, my name is Earlia Vicklinine and I'm a youth coordinator with Glor Namuna, um, which is the youth and community organisation in Belfast. Um, currently, we deliver a wide range of youth work programmes across the city, delivering on 15 um, youth programmes per week um, with um, upwards of 430 young people engaging in our service. Under the new funding scheme proposals, most of our units across the north would fall under the non-targeted um, generic funding scheme, which excludes expenses for staff and costs. With the exception of one unit in the Upper Springfield area, the Irish Medium Youth Clubs feel that the specifications in their area currently are not fit for purpose for them due to their level of capacity. This puts most of our clubs, and most importantly, our young people, at risk of losing the service that they have been engaging in with, with for the last 10 years. Because of this, some groups have already accepted that they don't fit and therefore will not register with the EA. The specifications under the local project stream have not yet been released, and at this time, there is no certainty as to what that will entail for us. 13 of our groups who had hoped to apply and expand under the scheme are currently delivering in areas with no specification to apply to. A number of groups have provisionally planned for consortium bids, allowing them to deliver a full time provision in particular council areas. It is now evident that we can't deliver across specifications, which means Irish youth clubs cannot enter into a consortium with another club. The remainder of our groups have planned for growth through the local area fund and anticipated becoming part-time units with secured funding for the next three years, which would have allowed for major growth in, in development and capacity and workforce, enhancing all of our programmes. This would have been complemented by the Regional Strategic and the Regional Development Fund currently um, available. We welcome that there is a specification under the Regional Development Fund for the Irish medium sector, which ensures the continuation of the important developmental work. This funding is to support Irish medium youth clubs in areas such as governance, resource and workforce development. However, it will not allow for regulated activity. 
In recent months, a lot of planning has gone on going into preparing our sector for the new scheme. And now that most of our groups will not have the positive outcome that we had hoped for. Over the last 10 years, we have been pigeonholed into very small pots of funding, and it has hindered our growth and development. We have worked tirelessly representing and engaging our sector in numerous platforms, including that of the regional advisory group, local advisory group, every consultation and reporting mechanism with the Department of Education and the Education Authority. And yet, still our sector feels that its immersion needs are not reflected within this scheme, a scheme that we had waited for for the past 10 years. So we are now in no doubt that our sector requires specific accommodation that will meet our needs. And for us, this was in priorities for youth and the regional assessment of need, which made specific reference to the legislative context underpinning youth work through the medium of Irish. And the new decade, new approach agreement will include Irish language legislation that will also give significant weight to the unique needs of our sector. And we're very aware that the barriers around the current specifications extend to the wider youth sector and a lot of groups face uncertain times. But in terms of the Irish medium youth sector, its groups and our young people, we're facing a loss of 43 sessions across the region. That's 170 hours of face-to-face -face delivery with over 1,600 young people. This will in turn socially exclude and further marginalise these young people from youth work programmes that allow for formal and formal learning opportunities through the medium of Irish. With the both mentioned, our sector faces a very bleak and uncertain future, and we have raised this with the Department of Education, the Education Authority and political parties, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank each one of them for the support over the last number of months, and we appreciate commitments given by EA to work with us on the matter. But the future of our sector, as we present to you today, is still very much in danger. Aoife, can I, I thank you for the, the work that you're doing as regional coordinator of Forum Nog and Orlea for the work you're doing as youth coordinator of Glor Namona and for the advocacy that you um, are doing on behalf of the Irish medium youth sector today and, and indeed to recognise the, the positive work of our Irish medium youth sector. Um, can I bring in uh, members if they wish to ask any questions? Um, uh, bring in uh, Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Eva and Orla, for coming along to this morning and presenting to the committee. Over the last number of weeks, I have engaged with yourselves and all the other groups in the Irish medium youth sector across the north, and I've heard your concerns, and you've touched on obviously the work that has already started with the Education Authority, um, and they have committed to supporting yourselves and all the groups in relation to the, the new funding model. So whilst we await the outcome of that work, um, I would like to ask these today, so aside from funding, what other issues or needs are there for the Irish medium youth sector in relation to continue to facilitate the growth that is required? Yeah, so Karen, thanks um, very much. And yes, um, we very much appreciate the support from yourself um, and your colleagues in the last number of months. In terms of the support that we would need for the development, we really anticipated seeing specifications in local areas where our groups are currently operating. So um, our groups are operating, in a, 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 as you know, across the region. Um, and if there had been specifications drawn up um, to, to meet our needs, such as the specifications that are for other groups to apply for that are currently providing provision, then this would have been transformational um, for our groups that would have allowed for workforce development, um, training opportunities, employment opportunities, and most of all, the service for the young people. Not one night a week, which we have been kind of pigeonholed into with the, the small amount of money the groups are receiving from the Irish Medium Fund. Um, but it would have allowed for three and four nights a week um, in areas where the capacity is there, um, the young people are there, and the needs are there. I think just to follow up on that, um, for us in the Irish medium youth sector and at times the Irish medium education sector, it can sometimes feel that we're a footnote in terms of priorities, and we're constantly working against that. So you're, you're nearly always on the back foot, which makes it quite difficult. I think if we were... Um, involved more in terms of planning, it would definitely help our delivery. 
and also in stages through our stages of development, if we were included at the outset, we wouldn't always have, have to be coming on a defence. And I think with that, Karen, um, it would be fair to say that um, at a local and regional level, our sector has been representing and has been vocal and has been sure in the needs of our young people in our sector at all platforms, as I currently stated. So, I mean, the regional advisory forms, the local advisory groups, any consultation that's taking place, stakeholder engagement events, our sector is always represented, and we don't feel that that has always been reflected in, um, for example, the local area plans. Do you know? Um, that's just one example, or even the, re the regional um, youth plans as well. So that's a concern that we would like to be, you know, included more in, in those arenas or, or taken seriously um, more than we have been in the past. Yeah, 100%. Eva and Orla, that's concerning. You know, this states that that is still how uh, the sector feels, um, and he's represented it very well. I suppose what I was trying to tease out there, um, and it is vital that you're involved in the planning and development as we go forward, but aside from funding, like I would know from the needs here in my own city, there's need for capital development. So mm -hmm. it's not too poor funding. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, uh, I know the Education Authority has come up, committed to working hard. Um, we need to see actually that in actions and, and coming out. So um, uh, as you know, I and my party is committed to working with you. So thank you so much for coming on to the rest of the committee today to let them know just all of the issues that's happening at the moment. That's me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and I appreciate uh, all our, our members and our witnesses being as concise as possible here, given that we're obviously going to um, hear from two organisations as part of our evidence session here. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan? Is Daniel there? He, he's still there. Daniel? Nope. Nope. Okay. Is Robbie there? Yeah, we should be. Robbie, can you hear us? Would you, Robbie Butler, would you like to come in? He's dropped off. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, Robbie, go ahead there. Okay, grand. So I see the spotlight on now. Aoife and Orlea, thank you so much. I'm going to try this formula, Nog and Gornamona. That's my first, there's my first bit of Irish <laughs> and a committee. Um, guys, it may not surprise you to know that um, I don't know a huge amount about what uh, you guys uh, are doing. Um, could you, I'm just going to ask you a few questions, genuinely interested. So I know that the, uh, edu uh, the Department of Education have a duty to develop the Irish medium sector. Youth work is slightly different in that there's a duty to support. Um, so if I was uh, if I uh, was looking my young people to avail of your services, what can you tell me what the outcomes are for the for your two groups in terms of what a young person can expect and and what the outcomes actually are? Yep. So our outcomes are that off the outcomes within the English medium sector. So we are bound with the same, um, you know, report mechanisms, service level agreements, um, you know, scorecards and stuff that um, our partners within the English medium sector would fulfil. So we follow the de um, Department of Education's outcomes. Um, and we report on that. So typically, if your young person was to attend one of our, our units, um, we have a wide range of programs that they can engage in, which includes um, personal development programs, generic youth work, outreach and detach work, um, training opportunities, volunteering opportunities. Um, so yeah, those outcomes are, are based on the priorities that the Department of Education have set out. Um, we also, within our own sector, have a model, um, which was um, a, a piece of research was carried out with Ulster University, um, and our, our youth work is kind of, um, it's underpinned by this model, which is giving our young people a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, a sense of ownership of the programme, and it's a needs-led programme, so what a young person comes in with, we will um, fully um, engage with them in trying to meet whatever needs they, they present with. I think that's and that's so the outcomes that the wider youth sector deliver on, we deliver also, but obviously it's underpinned and there's you know there's sense of outcomes coming from the language development, the linguistic development, and the sense of belonging that young people feel coming into a youth club where they're speaking their own language. 
No, I get that, and and thank you for that. It does give me a better a bit of a better picture. And the, the journey that has happened in this last ten years is amazing. Um, I will declare an interest. So I'm a, I'm an officer in the Boys Brigade. So obviously that's um a, it's a it's, it's a youth group and it's it's massive. Like it's really huge. But we rely like oh like about ninety nine percent on volunteers. Um, in terms of you you guys. What's the setup look like um, with regard to the proportion of volunteers needed to deliver this against what may be paid staff and stuff? So is, it, is there a high proportion of volunteers engaged? Uh, yes, um, like, like any other youth sector, we, uh, we're a development sector and we rely on volunteers like everyone else, but we, we also have paid staff and we believe that um, as we're most in the youth sector, that we're developing a professional sector and it delivers quality services to young people and to do that, we need to value our staff and volunteers. So we can't always base, base our entire service on just the goodwill of volunteers, unfortunately. Um, but yes, we rely a lot on paid staff also and their expertise in order to deliver to young people. And um, developing this homegrown sector through our management committees, our staff and volunteers have gone over and above on the call of duty at every stage. So yes, volunteering is definitely one of our core principles and values, but um, it's not, unfortunately, we're not able to run solely on volunteers. No, I, I get that. I think all, all organisations and even the Boys Brigade has a small team there. I think there's about eight, six more people working headquarters. And then you've got obviously your volunteers, which, which hold it up, as you said. It, it is very much in, in youth work and stuff. We, we do rely on, on our volunteers. And, um, and so can I ask you this here? I know, I think it was Katrina Rianne maybe it's kicked this off in terms of, and, and had secured some of that funding and it has moved on. Is it still only £5,000 a year? So, yes, the Irish Medium Scheme has been running for 10 years now. Um, our sector does receive other parts of funding based on the need and based on the emerging yeah. needs that we presented with um, back with the ELVs and with the EA in recent years. So our sector has been able to apply for example, the extended provision scheme, we get some money from the outreach scheme as well, and that has obviously um, contributed towards the growth and development in certain areas where groups have been able to avail of those schemes. So in terms of what we've seen coming in, um, as I had said earlier, our groups have been pigeonholed into small pots of money across various. So, and in reality for that, that has been an administrative nightmare for mm -hmm. us in the sector and for um, for the Education Authority and the officers that work with us in the sector. So the new funding scheme coming in was, we very much anticipated those issues sort of being rolled out um, and, you know, the Irish Medium Scheme being included within the new funding scheme, but a different mechanism, just as, as the entire sector has been waiting on um, and working. So, yeah. Yes, it's currently £5,000 for those local units on the ground, but there are other units who have been able to um, progress through other funding streams within the education authority. And can I just follow in on that? So there are organisations who were accessed in different funding streams, but apart from those one or two groups um, that will receive funding that would possibly match that of a part-time unit, uh, most groups are receiving between, I'm sure you have the figures there in front of you, but most groups receive between uh, £1,500 and £3,000. So that would be your average funding that's allocated to an Irish Medium Youth Club. Okay. Okay, Robert. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes, brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Uh, I, I, I'm going to invite uh, Daniel McCrossan in, but once I do that, um, I'll uh, be glad to invite our Youth Work Alliance representatives in and, and we can take further questions thereafter. Yeah. Uh, Daniel. Thank you, Chair. I'm having all sorts of technical difficulties with this. When you asked me to come in the last time, they didn't turn on my mic from your end, so that's what happened. Uh, whatever way, I just skipped to Robbie there. Uh, thanks very much for uh, your presentations and for being with us today. Uh, certainly on behalf of the SDLP, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, your concerns and some of the challenges that you have faced and continue to face. I want to focus in on funding, and, and Robbie, just before I do that, I want to say you're a bit prepared, you're well prepared today for a man that was in the Assembly so late last night. Uh, and in terms of question, in terms of the question around funding, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around the pot of money that's available. So what are the particular funding problems uh, being experienced by the Irish medium uh, youth sector? Can, can you outline that? And also, how do you think these issues can be addressed? 
in other words, what funding is required? And can you explain to us why in 2019, the Education Authority Review Report concluded that the Irish medium sector is in receipt of enhanced funding compared to other sectors? My, my concern is around this. It, it, I'm wanting to know what the exact pot of funding is, what the level of cut is that you should experience, <laughs> and what you require to ensure that the sector isn't disrupted. So, so thank you for your yeah, thank you. I, I'll start off, um, and I'm sure Leo will be able to give a more in-depth answer in terms of um, a local unit. But yeah. in terms of the wider Irish Medium Scheme, so the Ring Fence Scheme, which Irish Medium Youth Clubs are able to access to support their delivery. So that's where, as I've explained before, the average would be between fifteen hundred to three thousand pounds that an Irish Medium Youth Club is um, able to access. So, okay. in terms of um, over enhanced, as I stated, there's one a regional organisation that is funded to deliver regionally ourselves, Form the Nog, and there are maybe two other youth clubs that would be receiving more than just that Irish medium scheme. So the enhanced funding, um, yet yet to see that unfortunately. But in terms of the Irish medium review, we don't view the review as completed, and therefore we don't feel that we're in a position to talk about it. It was agreed at RAG nearly a year ago that the review wasn't complete, that it didn't reflect the sector, and that it would be that they would continue to work on that, and we're, we haven't heard anything from them. So I can't comment any further than that on the Irish Medium Review because to us we feel that it's incomplete. Um, or Leo, just, just, just on the review, just, yep. just on the review, I, I, I was spent able to get a bit with that because I wanted to tease yeah. out exactly what you've just said. Uh, that yeah. I, 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 I would be. View that it doesn't reflect the sector, it doesn't reflect the challenges the sector and faces, uh, and concerns. So, uh, I, I ease that out because I wanted you to say that. I think it's yeah. important that people hear that because uh, I certainly, from any of the discussions I've had with the Irish medium sector, have picked up on uh, considerable concerns in relation to funding uh, and a lack of resourcing. And we also have to remember that although there is more funding available in more recent years the Irish medium sector has been playing catch up for many years because it has been largely underfunded so i think that people need to understand that and don't be shy at all both of you or anyone in saying that publicly or clearly you know there will be some that will say uh, that the Irish medium sector is now overfunded but they have to remember that it has been extremely underfunded for a long time and we've been playing catch up and there's a huge deficit there that needs to be plugged uh, and, and also resources yeah, no, thank you. But that, that's the point exactly. And um, with the review, it just must be noted that there was no engagement with young people in terms of their needs and what they need from the sector. Um, yeah. Just with the, the enhanced or over enhanced funding. So um, just for an example, um, there, there are groups who, and I say it, we anticipated um, this, uh, you know, working with the EA over the years, that the new funding scheme would be our inroad to securing um, more funding, not losing, because we're going to be at a massive deficit. Um, so, you know, securing our, our, our services and becoming that mainstream that has been promised to us for the last 10 years, you know, priority three is going to come, this new funding scheme is going to come, and that just hasn't, um, it's not hard to play it out for us. Okay. So when you say Daniel, deficit, Daniel, I'm sorry, 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 Daniel, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to just step in briefly, okay? Um, I, our... We, we have two organisations with us today in relation to youth sector representation, keen to bring another organisation in. Um, f folks, please, please see this as the priority that we give to the youth sectors in our endeavour yeah. to include you, um, however briefly, in our session today. Uh, and I'm sorry that I do have to step in. We, we, can, we can follow up with other questions if there are time, but eager to bring in uh, Professor Sam McCready, Chairperson of the Youth Work Alliance and Ms. Mary Field, the CEO of Youth Work Alliance. Professor Thanks, Mary, thank you. Maybe we'll go first. Okay, okay. Mary. Thanks, Mary. Is she there? Um, I don't know, do you? Okay, I'll pick up Chris rather than have some, um, her time to see where New Year is. Um, you have going to have two clear points, one about funding and one about, let's call it COVID-19 and the way forward. Um, I'll take the second point, which is in our, in our paper. First of all, we are Youth Work Alliance. We are a membership-based organisation, over 130 members who are community-based frontline providers of youth work. 
So that's everything from your part-time youth club uh, to your full-time probation. So there's a whole range of membership there. Um, the first point I would make is, is about partnership working and collaboration. Um, let's say it's like a triangle where the Department of Education is one part of the triangle, Education Authority and the voluntary sector are the two other parts. From our perspective and experience, we have a very productive, positive working relationship with the EA. Uh, I can't say enough about that. That has been an emerging, developing, close partnership working. And uh, what I would point to is that I think the other part of the triangle in terms of a structure, not personalities, is the DE. We've been slightly disappointed in the interaction with the DE uh, over a number of years since we lost um, structures and bodies where we could engage with the, the formal education sector, with the Department of Education. Um, and what we'd be asking for is a more balanced approach. There used to be a body called the Youth Service Liaison Forum that consisted of the Department of Education, the Inspectorate, the Voluntary Sector, uh, Education Authority, formerly Education and Library Boards. And that was a very lively body where we engaged in a wider policy forum. Now, that's been missing for a number of years, so one of the first appeals to the education community is to support us to reinvigorate a body like that, whereby which the voluntary sector can engage in those uh, policy forum discussions. Um, the, let's look at what the second part of what I have to say. I'd like to encourage the unlocking of the voluntary youth work sector post-lockdown. Reading the Ministerial Minister's recent um, uh, letter, he's suggesting a very modest unlocking of the voluntary sector where he talks about limited summer provision focusing on 9 to 13 year olds and families of key workers, etc. Now, we would be encouraging a more ambitious. There's lots of resources out there, apart from our membership in terms of human resources, we have buildings. We would like to play our part in education restart and we're just feeling that it's a modest cautious approach at the moment and we can understand that but when you understand the youth sector it offers many things and i use a very simple traffic light system there's the green system where i would call a universal service where we all play a part in offering young people the generality of youth work provision that can be a uniform sector I heard robbie talk about that and i know william humphreys, humphreys is also very active in the uniform sector um, there's the ordinary youth work provision universal provision and then when you move into the sort of the amber colouring where there is early intervention in youth work. That's where your speed work and often other things occur. Well, young people may not be engaging uh, in um, the youth centres, but maybe we keep in touch with them. And then you look at the focused work, which is the red zone, and that gets a lot of attention. And the minister quite rightly is pointing to the need of supporting those children with particular needs, and that can be anything in terms of antisocial behaviour, drugs, suicide, mental health issues. But what I would alert is that putting all your resources initially into the red zone, where do those young people go whenever you're trying to get them out of that situation? Where can we redirect them to if other parts of the youth service are not functioning? So all within a cautious approach, um, we understand social distancing, we understand we've seen the guidelines, but I will be looking for an unlocking of the voluntary sector, uh, more in its entirety, um, rather than a very modest, cautious approach where there's a hierarchy of emphasis on um, children of a particular age, maybe a particular needs. I think we need to address a more broader point. So that's my very simple um, and I've got lots of examples, if, if required, of how we could engage more readily uh, in the voluntary sector and education restart. Okay. Can, can Mary hear us as well? Mary, like to come in? Can you hear me? Yes. If you speak as loud and clearly as you can, Mary, thank you. Apologies for all the technology problems this morning. Um, Mary Field, CEO of Youth Work Alliance. And first of all, it's good to see Aoife and Orlea here because some of what our members are saying about the new funding scheme are reflected in what Aoife and Orlea have said. Um, the Youth Work Alliance worked very closely with the Education Authority in the development of the EA's new funding scheme 
seven years we waited for it. And like what Arlia and Aoife have said, we knew that this new funding scheme would present many benefits to a needs-based approach to meeting the needs of children and young people, particularly those young people who were identified in priorities for youth, greater risk of social exclusion, marginalization, isolation, and because they experienced a combination of barriers to learning. So our members welcomed the publication of the new scheme, embraced the fact that it would be going live, if you like, on the 1st of October, and had started to prepare for that. We were therefore very disappointed when the Minister announced a delay to the implementation of the scheme to the 1st of April 2021. Yesterday, we did receive a communication from the Minister to say that there will be no further delays in the scheme, that it will continue to be implemented from the 1st of April. However, he has extended the application process. The point that we would like to highlight is Orlea and Aoife have already referred to um, extended provision. In past years, members have benefited from ministerial funds that have allowed extended provision, which has included outreach and detached work, extended opening hours for youth centres, but this funding is now is no longer available. And our members had been working towards the 1st of October implementation debt when they would access the new scheme, which would cover longer opening hours, outreach and detached work, special interventions for those young people deemed most vulnerable and at risk. So the sector has been left, our sector members have been left in limbo because there is no mitigation in place to mitigate the negative impact that the delay in the funding scheme has made from being delayed from an implementation of the 1st of October to the 1st of April 2021. So we have large numbers of young people who are going to lose out. Um, that the provision that was in place for them, and I can give you some examples of that later. Okay. Thank thanks, thanks very much indeed, uh, Professor McCready, um, uh, for and uh, Mary for your um, presentation. Um, can I ask members if they wish to ask further questions that maybe they would raise their hands and uh, start with the uh, the deputy chairperson, Karen Mullen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sam and Mary. And unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, this committee had planned to uh, meet with the Alliance and, uh, uh, and the Centre in Derry. So unfortunately, we have to rearrange that, but hopefully for the autumn. Firstly, I want to commend all our youth workers and the sector and yourselves for the work that you do. Um, I see the impact that youth work provides in my city and across the north. So I just wanted to put that on record. Mary, I also uh, welcome the new funding model and, and it's good to hear that update from yourself today that there will be no further delay. I met the Minister on this and the Education Authority. I think it's important that we continue on with that process, but also rightly so, highlighting um, that there was no mitigation in place and we need to look at that. We have raised this now a number of times. Um, I've heard from yourself and others across the sector that uh, youth work, youth work um, within the department feels undervalued. These are an afterthought. These are the last line in the most recent documents coming out. So after meeting with yourselves, I presented that to the minister, asked him to look at specific guidance which is being worked on and to set up a youth work reference group which has been set up. So it's vitally important that, um, that, that the involvement of yourself being addressed, as Sam has said, over the years that has, has lessened and these have been removed. So we need to work on that going forward. Sam, I just wanted to ask, you talked about unlocking youth services and you said you could give us some examples. Um, could you give us some, one or two examples on how you see yeah. that that would take place? Um, first, thanks, Karen. And first of all, we're talking about young people who are knocking on our doors. We're talking about parents who are knocking on our, on our workers' doors, and our memberships are telling that. We learn to catch up for young people. Um, I think youth work can play a very vital part in that as well. Um, getting kids school again for September 
you know, the three months off, and then they were looking at another two months without that classroom, whether it's real classroom or whatever. And I think they're two very practical examples. We've lots of examples that has been suspended where young youth work is in school and actively supporting and complementing formal education. And I think that partnership needs to be enhanced again. So learning catch up, getting school ready, and some are activities that are abridged to that. I mean, activities aren't something in their own right. Activities are there as a means to an end. Youth work will always say that. So some more activities, I think, have a very vital part to play in that. And what a lot of our youth workers are saying, Karen, is you can see what 10, 20, 30 young people gathering in the street now. But we're kind can of responsible adults engage with them. It does mean a bit of a contradiction. That we're encouraging young people to get out and meet and other people to meet. Wouldn't it be useful? if some of our youth workers could engage in those four young people and to establish those working relationships and to also get that dialogue and conversation going again. So learning catch up, um, more for youth work in that, getting kids school ready again, uh, some activities that are a bridge to, to those I think would be important, some street work again, some detached youth work, just to re engage with young people. She wants to hear their voices again and to know there is a friendly adult out there. That's what our membership is, is looking for. Youth workers back in schools, that could be looked at again. How can we complement? And it is important to say that youth workers and activity in the zone right needs to be seen, but also youth workers that complementary part to formal education. So there are some things that our members are ready to engage in, Karen, conversations with the department, conversations with teachers and schools again about how we can work with them on those things. Yes, Sam, they're all vitally important and I'm hearing the frustration, particularly over the last two weeks. Um, you know, youth workers want to get out and do what they do best and uh, mm -hmm. be up in the street, engaging with young people, getting them back in safely as we can, the, uh, the environments, and I see it here in my own city. I've been in regular contact with the minister just to try and get the, that guidance out. Um, and as of yesterday, um, it, they've the, the minister has come back to say that that should be coming out. So hopefully, I would like to see by the end of the week, Sam, that the direction and the guidance comes out from the department to allow our youth workers to get back out um, on the street, particularly over the summer, and then in prepar preparation for planning for September. So thank you for that. I'm going to allow all our members to come in. Thanks, thank you, Karen. Uh, Justin McNulty has raised his hand. I would encourage any other members that would like to ask questions in the short time that we have left to us to do so as well. Um, Justin, I've lost your hand. Was your hand raised? Yes? No, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead then. Go ahead. Uh, good, good morning. Or, is that, sorry, still morning. Yes, good morning, Mary and Sam and uh, Judy, Viva and Orleth. Is it Orleth or Orlia? Orlia. Orlia, sorry, Orlia. Um, I will traditionally pronounce that Orlia, Orlia, so from now on I'll pronounce that Orlia. <laughs> um, just particularly interested in your evidence from the, the Irish youth sector. Um, feel very passionately about this, and I know with the great work of uh, Ian Akwaka in Armagh, you do a recently opened centre there, which is just extraordinary, and, and the Irish language has spoken in Armagh for over 2,000 years, or um, Senator Verla was there many for, for, for centuries. Um, in terms of the funding available to you, you know, I, I'm just concerned that you feel so downtrodden after so much positive work has been done on behalf of the Irish language over, over the period of time that the, the assembly was actually down and the great work of Conrad de Gilliga and others to promote the Irish language and to say that it's not acceptable that the Irish language is going to be left behind anymore. How do you feel now that six months into a new assembly that you still feel downtrodden and left behind? Do you not feel let down? Well, we... Um... Justin, thank you. We, uh, as Aoife had stated just in her finishing statement, that the EA have made a commitment um, to work with, with our sector to try and iron out some of these issues and find a way forward. And that of Carm Mullen has been engaging with our sector also um, and has hosted um, some meetings between um, ourselves and the Education Authority. We've also um, in recent months met with the Department of Education as well. 
So we would hope um, that, um, you know, over the next load of weeks here, or a few, a few short months, that some of these issues could be resolved. But um, you talked about Conroy McGillie there, and I would like to add, you know, we are moving in, the Assembly's been up and running 10 years, and we are moving into that new decade, new approach, um, policies that are coming in, and there will be legislation around the Irish language sector, and we will be holding the department to account on that, you know, for the rights of our young people, um, to ensure that um, we don't continue to be left behind. But our sector is positive at the minute in terms of trying to um, further engage with the Education Authority and, and, and get a resolution for our concerns. And I just think, um, you, know, you know, we do feel um, at times we are overlooked and, like I said already, a footnote. Um, what was disheartening was that we were really excited about the new funding scheme. We came together as a sector. Our groups worked on consortium bids. Um, other organisations were working on larger bids to be able to stand as a part-time or full-time unit. We put a lot of work into it and for us to find out very shortly after that there was no space for us within the new funding scheme it was extremely disheartening. And I think one of our members used the words broken. That's so unfortunate. Well, I, would, I would just like to, to thank the great work of Sean Mothers, uh, Graham O'Kearn and, and Garage of Agra in, in Armagh. The incredible work they've done over many years. I mean, the, the creation of that Inhek Wagra Centre is just a gem, a gem in Armagh City. Um, and they have had problems in relation, in relation to recruitment of officers to work between both Armagh City and Neary City, and that's been a challenge in relation to the funding mechanism. Can you give me, can you just spread, give me, enlighten me more on that, that challenge? Yep. So basically, local, yeah. So basically, the specifications that that's what we had hoped for through consortium bids that in areas where one group may not have had the capacity to deliver on a full time specification that that could be shared out across council areas. Um. So an example of that would be currently in Belfast, Lorna Mona would work across four units. Um. And bringing together the capacity and the workforce there. So as I said, we had planned for that, and as you know, in our MAD, that there would be groups coming together. But a specification is now set out in one local area. But that may be, um, for example, in Belfast, the Lennardine area, and you can't cross over into the Andersonstown area. So you can't spread out of your own your own geographical area. And we had hoped that we could work through um, across council areas. So as I said, we had hoped that it would spread across council areas. But just reference, um, you reference ARMA, and ARMA is one of our groups that there's no specification at all there for them to apply to. So even if they were able, if they widened the mm -hmm. scope of the area that you can deliver to, ARMA still have nothing to apply to. Sad. Okay, Gurma Yogurt. Yep, Gurma Yogurt, just. Um, and thank you, Mary and Sean, as well, for your, for your evidence today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Justin. Thank you. And just to advise members that the, the Education Minister um, is waiting patiently for us. So, um, Catherine, if you, uh, bring in for a final question, if you can make it brief. Thank you. Catherine Kelly. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'll be brief. Um, thank you all for your presentation. Um, the Irish medium sector and indeed the youth sector as a whole will play a vital role in the months ahead as life changes for our young people forever. Um, Aoife and Erlea, your presentation today to this committee has ensured the issues um, that your issues are highlighted on yet another platform and with um, other members. I know Ogogris Nahomi um, carry out a lot of amazing work in OMA um, and my question is how does uh, Forum the Nog support them? So Forum the Nog works very close, closely with Ogo Gutnohomi, so we have a close relationship. And actually, uh, Michael, who would be on the committee member but on Ogo Gutnohomi, is actually a member of Forum the Nog staff. So the past year, we accessed um, through the EA's outreach funding scheme, we secured funding to um, look at rural isolation. So um, obviously, OMA was one of the areas that we focused in on. And Michaeline followed out that work across Vermont and Oma Mid Ulster. So, particularly in the last year, we've seen a major development in that area and worked very closely with them. They had big hopes also through the new funding scheme. The specification in that area is a very extensive full time specification. So, um, they had hoped to go again with a consortium bid with a group in Greencastle and a group in Carrickmore. But as Erlia had previously said, 
including the, the um, cross specs issue, they now can't follow through with what they had hoped in their plans. So they're left in very much in a grey area also. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry. Just to add in, Catherine, sorry, we also have quite a large representation of young people from Ogris Nahomi who would sit on our Costanello, which is our youth committee. Brilliant, brilliant. Gorm Mayogov. Gorm Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Mary, Sam, Aoife, Orlea, thank you so much for your presentation today. I'm really sorry that we've run out of time um, for further yeah. questions and answers. Um, we look forward to remaining in contact with you, uh, and our committee clerk will summarise the actions that we're going to take and, and follow up on your behalf. So thank you very much for your uh, presentations thank today. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Clark, do you want thank to you. summarise briefly our actions? So, Chair, if uh, broadcasting will bring the members back into the spotlight, so I'm um, thinking maybe the committee wants to Right to the Education Authority, uh, I think as Daniel had indicated, just asking for details of the, the pots of money that are available for Irish medium and what typically they get. Ordinarily, I would get this sort of information from assembly written questions, but there haven't been many of those lately. Um, so it's what's available, what they're getting, what they could get under the uh, new scheme, and also ask them for the status of the review. So I put the review into your papers. I find it on the internet. It did mark, it was marked as draft not to be published, um, so I don't know how it's on the internet. So maybe we ask the Education Authority what the status of that is, and then additionally ask them, uh, in line with Professor McCready's question, about the Youth Work Policy Forum and how the authority is going to work with youth groups uh, going forward to, you know, in partnership, as was suggested. Chairperson, members? Yep, members agreed. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Okay. Uh, as I said, members, I understand the Education Minister uh, is waiting patiently uh, to brief the committee today, and so members are content. We'll move to our next agenda item, which is the Department of Education uh, COVID-19 update. Uh, can I confirm that we have the Minister for Education, Peter Weir, uh, and the Permanent Secretary and Deputy Secretary of the Department of Education with us? There we go. Yeah. Um I'm here as our Derek and John. Yep, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. That's a very, very organised setup there this morning, Education Minister. We can see and hear you all very we're, clearly. We're, we're, thank we've you. We've had our, our tape measures out to make sure we are doing appropriate levels of social distancing yeah, on a chair as well uh, in connection with it. Your volume is, is low, so you may have to speak as, as loudly and clearly as, as okay, possible. I, I, yeah, I don't know if there's, we'll, uh, bring the, there's a sort of a microphone device and bring it a little bit closer, but I'll try and that's, I'll speak up. If, if at any stage... That's helpful, if any stage, sorry. Yep. Okay, if at any stage there's, there's any complications with the sound, if you just let, let us know, we'll try and speak loudly. No, no, I, no problem. I suppose by way of... Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. I suppose by way of introductory uh, remarks, and I know there are some of the issues we touched on last night at the, at the debate, um, I suppose in terms of developments, uh, obviously then with the main level of guidance that's been given to schools, schools are trying to translate that um, into the particular procedures that they will apply in the, the autumn term uh, and beyond. Uh, obviously, I think one of the issues, particularly as regards guidance, um, is that uh, for much of the guidance will apply in, if you like, for the foreseeable future in any set of circumstances. So, for example, whether you have two metres, one metre or no social distancing, many of the, the positions as regards um, trying to make sure that there's a, a limited level of interaction so there isn't cross-contamination, issues around hygiene, around drop-off, and a whole range of issues that probably apply irrespective of whether there's any level of adjustments. But as I've made fairly clear uh, as well, I believe that, that the way things are progressing, uh, we are in a better place and consistently uh, across the Ireland getting into a better place. Uh, and so therefore, if, uh, if it continues in that direction, I would hope to then uh, see if there are further adjustments that can be made before the beginning of the school term across the board, um, really sort of five days a week uh, education in, in classrooms for uh, pretty much everybody, um, possibly the exception of maybe a, few, uh, a small number of pupils who, because of extreme medical conditions, for instance, it, it, the parents may feel it's not advisable for them to be in. Additionally, I suppose in the last week or so, there's been specific, uh, if you like, the, the main guidance has been, been issued, 
but obviously there's a range of um, other elements of guidance which we're hoping to uh, provide. Um, the specific guidance has been work has gone on with the, the special schools then to provide then uh, specific guidance in terms of uh, special schools. Obviously, just while I'm touching on that, that subject, we've been working with the EA uh, on the issue of placements. And again, there's been a level, please say there's been considerable level of progress um, on that, uh, particularly with individual placements and um, with the issue as we were looking then at where we can put in place sort of um, base provision. Uh, and certainly in terms of the, the uh, progress, um, last week, I think, whenever the, the initial figure was revealed, it was 285. Um, today, that figure is down to 206. Now, it's 206 too many, but it has been at least a level of progress uh, over the week. And we're looking not simply as at what um, interim measures can be put in place, which will cater for uh, everybody within the system, but also as part of that in terms of a, that this, how this can feed into a wider, longer-term uh, position. Uh, it's also the case that there will be a number of um, outward-facing pieces of advice that will be given particularly around the issue of transport and the executive as a whole, I'm sure many of you know, are, are considering how we deal with the issue of transport. That has obviously had very major implications for school transport, but also in the wider, the wider context of the, the public sector. Uh, and I would hope that that would be something that within a short space of time we could get a level of resolution on. Uh, it's also the case that uh, we've issued guidance in terms of remote learning, and members will obviously be aware of the... Um, quite comprehensive reports, so I anticipate that, that probably not everybody has read everything in connection with them. But as part of the issue in terms of remote learning, we were going into fairly uncharted territory. It was clear that the, the normal role of ETI was no longer going to be particularly able to be reformed. So as a department, we had commissioned ETI both to monitor what was happening in terms of uh, remote learning, but also provide levels of, of guidance. They have done so, and I think this is something which I very much welcome in terms of the report, have now provided particular levels of guidance to schools. Uh, I think a lot of the findings, um, it's of a, I suppose, a qualitative nature rather than a quantitative nature, uh, are not entirely surprising within that. But in, in addition to the guidance, I think it's also very important that uh, what they have also given and tried to draw, where there have been very good examples throughout, um, throughout Northern Ireland of best practice and have used, I think, the report to highlight uh, exemplars. On the issue of funding, um, obviously then there have been a number of bids that we had put in directly as regards to the June monitoring round uh, situation. Now, I think there will be further issues that will arise and probably become clearer whenever we see the, there's a certain amount of work happening in terms of restart of schools, but some of the detail of that uh, will only become clearer both near the time and when we see restarting. But obviously there are three particular aspects of funding which were able to be addressed via the June monitoring round. First of all, in terms of the support that we can give to um, to children over the summer uh, in terms of the free school meals entitlement, uh, that has been uh, agreed by the executive and the funding has been made available. Um, and additionally, that will cover about 100,000 um, children with uh, the way that will be processed will be two payments during July uh, and August. Uh, and proportionately in Northern Ireland, we would have a much greater level of coverage and support for children that are, than are happening in other jurisdictions. And also the, what has been a very successful uh, provision of the Eat Well, Live Well has also received uh, funding as well. And we'll cover over the summer about 5,000 children uh, on that day-to-day -day basis. Uh, secondly, obviously, in terms of uh, childcare, uh, there's been a recognition of both the support that is there for childcare and, I suppose, initially a lot of the focus was on trying to ensure particularly that closed settings were able to keep themselves their head above water. Uh, that has, the schemes have not been without problems in the way they've been administered, but we're working particularly with the Child Care Reference Group and with the Depart uh, Department of Health, who are the key regulators, to try and make sure that, uh, that as we roll forward, that we have, it's critical that we have um, child care that is fit for purpose. And that indeed, um, I think that as the, uh, lockdown eases as the economy opens up that we have alignment so that effectively I suppose that supply meets demands and there's been a number of areas of progress there both with first of all the widening of Department of Health's definition of key workers to a point that uh, from Monday of this week that effectively 
the availability is there towards anyone, irrespective of whether they're counted as, as a key worker or not. But that, again, will also be a level of work in progress. And finally, I suppose, in terms of financing, um, in terms of uh, financing, particularly on learning recovery, uh, there had been proposals of um, two smaller aspects uh, that will be small interventions over the summer, particularly around the issue of where a number of schools uh, have volunteered uh, to do uh, some uh, sort of a focused element of uh, recovery for their, their pupils. This is, was entirely voluntary in its nature uh, because we believe that, that uh, teachers and all staff do deserve that, that break. What we have said is we don't want where schools are doing something of that nature to be to their detriment. Consequently, I think there will be that level of financial support. Um, and at the moment, that is likely to be somewhere in the region between about 40 to 50 schools that Northern Ireland are going to be doing that. And particularly, I suppose, looking ahead and in terms of the details are now being worked out, we received funding, which will be for the bulk of the recovery side of it, on an engaged programme, which will run uh, certainly throughout the next academic year. And that will be particularly focused in at areas of social deprivation to try and bridge the gap in terms of some of the, the lost recovery. Final point just to want to make in terms of one other area of uh, decision. Uh, and, you know, there is not, as I said, a consensus over exact elements of timing within uh, within various organisations in regards to the youth sector. Um, the compromise position that was that was reached, because some, in terms of regional youth funding from EA, wanted things to happen immediately. Others wanted a very long delay. The position, obviously, is there was there was a level of delay caused by COVID, but in terms of the new funding for regional youth organisations, um, the implementation will remain in April of 2021. Representations were made that in terms of the application process rather than the implementation, that particularly for a range of the uniformed organisations, which are dependent upon unpaid volunteers, much more so than uh, than maybe other sectors, that they felt that the, the, the deadlines, which I think were due to be the for stage one and stage two of the application process, the 3rd of July and the 28th, um, those time scales. I've listened to those representations and have signed off on uh, the opportunity for uh, applications at stage one to run until the 3rd of September and uh, stage two to the 30th of October. This will allow enough time for EA to um, process and implement things so that uh, the situation that in terms of the implementation of funding can take place from the beginning of the new financial year in April. Uh, as a particular number of organisations had expressed concern, if there was any further delays, that that would leave them in a degree of trouble. So that, that's where I'm sure there'll be a lot of issues, uh, Chair, that yourself and members will want to pick up, and between myself and the team, we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for making yourself available to the Education Committee today. Um, we have reached the end of the school year, and the start of the next one is approximately seven weeks away. Uh, you've, you have published new school day guidance, curriculum guidance, special school guidance, and um, attained uh, a number of uh, funding streams um, for free school meals, childcare, and summer activity. Um, can I start by asking if there's a budget allocated to the Engage program for numeracy and literacy recovery? Well, I think the figures are about 12 million across the board. Yeah. Basically, what we, what we had within that, there are two smaller schemes which are operating, going to operate during the summer of, of a uh, likely to be a virtual classroom, and also then the support for uh, schools that are um, in a position where they're doing voluntary schemes. Um, there's an overall budget I think has been agreed of 12 million uh, for this financial year for uh, the the overall. Uh, learning recovery schemes, you know, I would estimate that roughly speaking between 90 to 95 percent of that will be on the engage well, side of things. Um, you know, we're looking roughly speaking, I think, between the other schemes, maybe some of the reason of 600, 700,000. Yeah. The balance of the 12 million would be spent in, on engage on that basis. That is for this financial year. Now, that um, would leave open also the possibility, uh, two possibilities. Obviously, whenever some of the, the detail on the scheme is scoped out, if there's a feeling that there is a need for a greater level of spend, then there is an opportunity, I suppose, for us to ask for additional money. 
but also if there's some spend to take place during the 21-22 period, because obviously the school year doesn't necessarily align with the financial year, there would be the, that, that opportunity um, uh, as well. Okay. The, the new school day guidance um, covers a range of issues. Can I seek clarification? Does the new school day guidance require schools to return year seven on August the 24th in a full-time capacity, regardless of the yes. impact of this on access uh, to school for other year groups? Yeah, the, the idea, well, there's actually three groups, year groups that have been identified, which is again, not the similar position that's been taken in other jurisdictions that year seven, years 12 and year 14 would be in a position, the requirement is that they do return on a full-time basis. Uh, Cut out. God. Minister, we've lost sound. Apologies. Oh. Oh. No. Oh. Sorry, just bear with this minute. Apologies, the Minister. The capacity to be able to deal. Oh, can you hear me now? We sorry. we lost we lost you. Yeah, just, yeah, sorry. We lost you momentarily there, but go, go ahead. Sorry, I've got sorry. What 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 I was saying is that the it identifies three year groups throughout the system, years seven, twelve, and fourteen for that uh, early cohort to return, uh, effectively by way of consensus agreement um, in terms of timing with the unions, effectively a week ahead. Uh, of the others, because schools are only dealing with a proportion then of their of their children, and again, as I said earlier, this may well move on in the broader the broader sense. We believe that's something that could be easily um, coped with. Um, I think, again, a lot of uh, other jurisdictions are looking. I know uh, issues in the Republic of Ireland are a little bit unclear at this stage, but I know across other parts of the United Kingdom they're looking at, at <laughs> levels of foot return uh, in the sort of August September. Uh, time frame um, and we believe this is something which can be relatively easily accommodated in terms of in terms of numbers as regards that currently obviously with the guidance in terms of the uh, the one meter situation for a lot of schools um, are not in a position clearly to be able to uh, have a full return on the current restrictions for all year groups uh, when it comes to September but obviously as part of that on the current position we put in effectively minimum requirements uh, of schools for both primary and post-primary in relation to that. But just just to be clear, it's not just a, a week early start, it's a requirement to uh, continue that year in a full capacity, whatever the impact that has on the capacity of other year groups to access the school. Sorry, I've lo we've lost your sound again. Chair, just, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Just, to, yeah, sorry, no, to clarify, it would be at least a full return for those three year groups for that, that week for every pupil. Uh, uh, the situation from the 1st of September on the current position, uh, and again, as I said, I would have hoped that this, this can change, uh, all year groups would be on a similar basis from the 1st of September so that it would be um, if a school. Uh, you know, would be in a situation where uh, they can only accommodate a certain level of percentages, uh, then that would apply across the board largely. Now, where I think there would be a, a certain level of differentiation will be if you come to the upper uh, age range of the school, and particularly as regards year 12 and year 14, uh, it's not specifically once you get into December that they're being prioritised, but because particularly, I suppose, at the A-level side of it, and to a lesser extent at GCSE, Sometimes uh, class sizes and subject sizes uh, will quite often be considerably smaller than they would be in other year groups. Uh, it is this is very feasible for uh, throughout the period. For instance, if you take the year fourteen and particularly the year twelve, they may well be able to be, uh, catered for in their entirety, um, consistent with the social distancing side of it. So, part of this is supposed at least to create. Um, I think for pupils a floor rather than a ceiling and clearly if schools can go further than what is required from the minimum side of it then they, they uh, ultimately I think should be doing that but again I would hope that this is something that um, within the next number of weeks this can be overtaken by events. I understand that. Um, if it isn't overtaken by events then it, there is a distinct possibility that schools will have different capacity to accommodate year seven yeah. 
vis a vis different schools? Well, no, I, I, think, I think what I would say, Chair, is um, in terms of the capacity to look after year seven on that week of um, August the 24th, for that one week period, because only one seventh of their overall uh, capacity would be in. I think it should, be, should not be difficult to be able to accommodate uh, every child in P7 during that week. It is clear that where there will, if, if we don't get that change uh, across the board in primary schools, that will put a general level of um, restriction for many primary schools. Um, and, but on the basis of primary schools, for September, the, the idea that, that any of the year groups would be pretty much on a, on a the same position uh, within a school, so it wouldn't be P5 or P6 would not be any different, or P2 wouldn't be any different from. P you're talking about the the uh, September period because if you're talking about getting the whole school in, for some schools, some schools will be able to accommodate everybody, other schools will be able to accommodate a, a proportion. Now none of that is ideal, but what I don't want to say to schools is if you can accommodate more than the minimum, it is not a question of schools then being restricted to the minimum. On the contrary, the minimum should be, by its nature, the, the minimum. No, I, I, I accept that, but you, you, yeah. you accept that if uh, a de any degree of social distancing pertains in September or indeed needs to be returned, that uh, schools will have varying levels of capacity by nature of their school infrastructure uh, to accommodate year seven pupils. So you may have year seven pupils in one school in more days than in another school? Sure, I don't, I don't think so, because we're talking about... Well, yeah, you mean, sorry, yes, you mean in terms of the fact that if some schools are able to... But th that will be the same for every uh, everybody in terms of a primary school. As if we are down this route, it means in terms of the classroom time, may vary from school to school in terms, but it, exactly. I'm not quite sure if we're talking about from the 1st of September, where that would be particularly different from P7 as opposed to P5 in that regard. No, Look, it no, is also no. one of the reasons why, why it is highly preferable to reach a situation in which everybody is in all the time. Yeah. But, you know, do we want to see if a school can go, and many schools can I, I think it would be wrong to say that we want to restrict any school to the minimum. No, of, of course we're all. I mean, let's, let's remember throughout throughout this, children, albeit it is not on the same level on it, the idea would be that through, if we have a, a mixture of classroom learning, it is still the idea that children will at least be taught five days a week. The issue, I suppose, is that remote learning is not of, uh, by definition, however much it will be pushed, however much um, that there will be very strong guidance. It is not, it can never be of quite the same level as, as classroom uh, learning. Yeah, no, and of course we're in full agreement that um, the, the aim has to be um, to get back to, to full-time learning uh, as possible. Um, final question for me, and, and uh, it's not to engage in a, a full debate with you, and you'll, you'll obviously acutely aware of my concerns with regards to um, variable and unequal educational opportunity at that year seven. Um, sorry, you, sorry, uh, Chair, you, you, broke, you broke up there slightly. I just I, I okay. couldn't hear a bit of that. I'll try. I'll try and go straight to my question then, Minister. Um, you obviously aware of my concerns in relation to year seven. Um, you, you have legitimately asked um, for people that are concerned with regards to the sitting of tests in year seven to um, come up with alternatives. Um, I suppose I, I was endeavouring yesterday, and would do so again today, to legitimately ask, is the, the recommended criteria um, of the Department of Education not a, a suitable alternative to consider? Chair, the position in relation to that is schools are, are perfectly entitled to use academic selection or to select on the basis of not using academic selection. The criteria, I think, which have been referred to are really where a school is not using academic selection on that, on that basis. So a school is entitled to that, but let's not pretend if a school is using criteria which does not involve academic selection, then it doesn't involve academic selection. And these are clearly, A, schools that want to use academic selection, and from 
you know, one could get into a level of um, sort of legal about what constitutes a, a grammar school, but realistically, uh, in most people's understanding of grammar school, if a grammar school is not using academic selection as a means to deal with oversubscription, then to what extent is it a grammar school or to what extent is it effectively a comprehensive school? The, the point is, if a school wants to use academic selection, it is clear that there isn't a viable alternative um, other than really a, a test uh, for that. If a school wants to entirely or temporarily completely abandon academic selection, then so be it. But the, the criteria, the alternative criteria that have been referred to are principally focused in on the basis of where it is a non-selective school in terms of um, academic uh, criteria. Many schools do that, and that is perfectly legitimate and perfectly fine, but that's where I think the weakness, uh, to some extent, of squaring the circle of saying, um, we can't have a, you know, we can't have a test, but um, we want to be sort of a, an academic selection-based school, and that's where I think the problem lies. Okay. I, I'll, I will move us on here, Minister, but just a very brief comment. The, the Department of Education um, guidance on admissions criteria does not does not make the argument that it applies only to non-selective schools, but I'm conscious I need to give other members an opportunity it's, to I, ask I think, questions. I think it's fairly, it should be fairly obvious in, in certain regards, but go ahead. Well, I, don't, I don't know why it, it ought to be. I, I think it's actually quite robust criteria, um, and that, that's well, why it, you know, I, if, I'm if not you sure could, why it's not a suitable explain to me how anybody's, uh, anybody's lexicon that effectively you can have a grammar school um, without academic selection, yes, technically because of the, the, the way that school governance works, it's something to be bad as a grammar school, but in anybody's understanding of what is a grammar school, if you are not having any method of criteria which refer to academic selection, then I think it is effectively a grammar school in all, but in only in name, only in that regard. And look, I have no problem. Look, there are people who will argue very vociferously and have very strong points of view in terms of a non-selective, comprehensive education. And people can, can make that point of view. But what I think, I think is a certain level of um, intellectual gymnastics is to create a situation in which we say, well, we're still having grammar schools, but they're not going to select by academic selection. That, that is not what I think ultimately would be my understanding, or indeed the vast bulk of people's understanding out there of what would constitute effectively a grammar school. Okay, there, there are non-selective grammar schools in Northern Ireland, and there are grammar schools again, not again, using that, selection that, that not this year speaking, in Northern because, Ireland. Well, with, and with respect, Chair, the situation is that, that the legal definition of a grammar school relates to its form of governance. But I think the common understanding of a grammar school is one that uses uh, academic criteria as its means of entry. That is what I think the public will understand. That indeed in terms of, uh, for many parents who are seeking a grammar school place, is what they are understanding. So look, okay, let's, have a wee bit of, let, let's have a wee bit of honesty in this debate. And if somebody wants to say, let us have entirely a comprehensive system in which there is no academic selection, that is an entirely valid point and is an entirely valid point for particular schools, any school to pursue. But let us not pretend that if you get rid of academic selection, that you effectively have a grammar school system. It, 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 it isn't really the case. Okay, Karen Mullen, MLA, Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, uh, Minister, again, for your time. It feels like uh, we're in a social bubble, because I think it's only a few hours <laughs> Hope you've been drinking plenty of strong coffee uh, in the meantime, probably for a uh, long journey last night, I would have thought, but anyway. Definitely, uh, Minister, um, but I think it shows all of our commitment to work together, to do our best to prepare for uh, September. Um, so the, the sound is breaking up uh, between the two, so I'm going to try and keep it as concise as possible. Minister, you will be aware this morning we heard from Stram Mullis on their, their survey and their findings, and also alongside that, um, the ETA survey that we, we have received um, that we still have to go through in a lot more detail. Both have re report, reported the impact 
um, over the, the, the last number of months have had. So I just wanted to really ask yourself, um, there's much to be done, and that is glaringly obvious from last night and this morning, um, and a time is against us. What extra resources are you putting in place within your own department to be able to deal with the level of work over the next seven to eight weeks? Well, in, in terms of that, I suppose we feel that, that from a financial point of view, and the Restart Programme is, is looking at this, that uh, if there are additional costs that will help reopen a school, so it's, say, a deep clean or it's provision of particular levels of equipment, of PPE, for instance, if there's a range of those things on it, I think that's absorbable within the, within the system. Uh, similarly, as we were looking to see, in terms of any provision that can be made to schools, I think it'll be helpful. The more that, in terms of equipment, we can capitalise will be, will be critical. But in terms of ongoing costs, um, you know, we would need, I think, there will need to be a level of assessment of precisely uh, what that will be. But if there are ongoing costs, that will be something that will have to be sourced by way of additional funding from, from the executive. Because, you know, apart from very small pockets of, of money, um, you know, there is not a, there's not a big sort of bank account pool that we can really dip into from within the department. You know, all money was... And I should say as well... Very specifically, uh, obviously, I've mentioned that in terms of the learning recovery side of it, there has been 12 million being directly allocated to the department, which is what we asked for in terms of the, the programme, of which 11 million plus of that will be directly in the Engage programme. So there has been those, those specific resources that have been able to be uh, obtained. But if there is, if there's an ongoing issues, then we will need additional funding from, from the executive. Thank you, Minister. I'm just looking at Derek and John there. It was more really around within your own department. People have been working extremely hard and there's been a lot of pressure over the last couple of months. So it's really just given, you know, you may not be able to say, but uh, I know everybody will try the best. But is the capacity there at the minute within the department to take on this extra workload? I think, I think, I think. Derek, Derek's keen to take that particular one, yeah. Am I looking that haggard, Karen? <laughs> no, Derek, it's me. I'm looking at my reflection back if I could turn this video off. So if you're feeling any way, let me know. <laughs> you're obviously feeling sorry for me. I mean, you know, I have made the point to the committee that everybody is working very hard, and I appreciate that. And, you know, publicly, I would place on the record my thanks to all of my staff in the department for the tremendous work they've done. We are tired. But, I mean, the answer to your question is, Karen, you know, we aren't going to get a lot more staff to do this. What we have done is reprioritize. We have stood yeah. things down. And I know that has caused difficulties for the committee, quite obviously. You know, for example, a hugely important process like area planning has slowed down because we redeployed all of those staff to help in the new school day guidance. Um, other work, the transformation program, has been repurposed. John and his team are dealing with COVID. That's the way we do it. We can't ask everybody to keep the day job going and do the COVID response. So we have to prioritize within what we've got. I should say also, Karen, that we are actively encouraging all our staff to take annual leave because they need it and they deserve it. Yeah. But thank you for your concern. No, absolutely. And, I mean, I, and the staff may be chipping together to, to buy me sort of a, a ticket away somewhere yeah, uh, type of thing in that, in that regard. I, I don't know it's if it's there's right. maybe a return ticket in, in <laughs> but that, but... We've got the yeah, minister a one-way ticket to print. Put him on one-end bubble. Just a, just a few more, uh, very quick. Um, uh, just, again, commend you on the work of the free school meals and the eat well, love well. You've sort of given up on that. That's great to see everybody on that and hopefully... We'll continue that under the future, like to see it. Minister, there was an announcement this week um, in England of uh, extra major capital investment for schools. And I was just wondering, will any funding be made available through that announcement through the Barnet formula for here? Um, and if so, would yourselves be able to bid for extra capital within this year? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think I got the gist of that. You sort of um, went off my... Yeah. We're exploring, I think, in, in terms of uh, what well, is this particularly on the capital side in terms of the Barnet consequentials? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think that would be likely to have um, Barnet consequences. What I would point out in terms of uh, limitations a little bit in the capital, I mean, I think additional will be helpful. But to take an example, when uh, the Prime Minister, I think, made reference to a billion pounds, and sometimes these things are not always quite 
as they appear. So we're working with colleagues in DOF, we're trying to scope this out. Barnet consequences from, Northern Ireland, from a capital point of view would be roughly about 28 or 30 million, I think, on that basis. I think that's about, about that basis. Now, if you take a look at, for example, the, the capital announcement that was able to be made um, last week in terms of major capital works, 50 million. So um, I think where that potentially would give us a bit more headroom in terms of spend would mean, I think there is likely to be um, certain short-term capital costs. Yeah. And uh, to be fair, particularly in terms of restart of schools, the more that we can directly capitalise in, in terms of some of that spend, the better, because I think that's where the pressure in the short term will be will be lesser. Uh, from less but, so um, as with, with all these things, it tends to be finance and treasury will have a level of discussion around this. Um, there's sometimes going to be a bit of tug of war because it is also the case that governments of whatever hue sometimes tend to make uh, an announcement which whenever you drill down into the detail may or may not be as transparently useful as it appears. So that, that's where I suppose we're trying to explore. Uh, and largely speaking, the points of contact are between finance and treasury on, on that issue. And obviously as well, if there are Barnet consequentials, be it on capital or resource, um, strictly speaking, in terms of obviously within devolved administrations, while we would bid for that money, ultimately that would simply come into the centre. Uh, and I'm sure other ministers, as with as the same way as we will sometimes get a a share of the cake, that if, if there is a an announcement, um, I don't know, on you know, on a particular say a particular health announcement that, that happens, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's ring fenced into health either. You know, so it's, yeah. it cuts both ways in that, in that regard. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. That's me. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, again for uh, joining with with the committee. Um, two two uh, short and, and practical questions, Chairs, with a number of principals who were, first of all, indicating that they were pleased that uh, practical advice had now started to flow uh, to, to to the school, um, and. Uh, but some, some concerns about the interpretation of that advice uh, within the actual school setting. I suppose it, it was more in connection, uh, Minister, where there were infants involved and indeed uh, around the toileting and the hand washing issues. Is it possible, uh, Minister, for a, a school principal uh, to actually get practical professional advice on a face-to-face -face basis in the school setting. Um, secondly, perhaps I've had a number of parents this week, sorry, last week actually, um, on the uh, public school transport, the, the public transport mm -hmm. to, to school. And indeed, I suppose this is because we're coming towards the end of the school year and parents thinking about their return to school. Perhaps, uh, what can you say to assuage maybe the concerns of parents on public transport at this stage uh, for their just children? Take those, those couple of points. If, if there's um, if there's specific elements of advice that people want um, further help with in some level of one to one discussion, I'm sure something can be arranged. I suppose, and this is part of the the, the almost eternal dilemma that, that is there with guidance is the extent to which, on the one hand, there's a desire for something to be prescriptive and precise, but also to give to balance that out by giving a level of flexibility because there will be individual circumstances will, will vary uh, from school to school. On the issue of transport, um, again, th there is a bit of ongoing discussion. We, we've had lengthy discussions with EA, with uh, TransLink and Department of Infrastructure. To a large extent, a lot of this will depend upon the wider position that the executive lands on as regards transport. If we are, if we are left with a model which is very prescriptive in terms of social distancing, um, that will create considerable problems as regards transport. If there are, there's a wider agreement in terms of the level of mitigations that can be put in place and what's appropriate, particularly for children, then I think that, that a lot of this can be solved. You know, I would hope that the executive would come to a relatively clear position relatively soon, but obviously 
I can't really discuss too much in terms of the details of, of cross-cutting issues that the potentially coming to the, the executive, but clearly, clearly it was implications in terms of transport. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan. Daniel? He's there, he's there. Yeah, can you hear me okay, Chair? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Minister, good to see you. Uh, I'm liking the new format. You look like the three musketeers sitting along there, so uh, all ready to get these issues started in terms of education. Um, so there may, there do you may hear me okay? Do you hear comparisons, but... Uh... <laughs> I'm in better mood today. I've had mixed sleeps as I got home, <laughs> Minister. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be as blunt as I was last night. <laughs> David Canning told me off today. Here, Daniel, do you call to favour and get to the questions? Thanks. <laughs> I was, uh, Minister, I have a couple of things written down here. Uh, I was shocked to hear earlier in the week. Uh, the 285 children with SEN remain unplaced at the end of June, and this is a point that was raised in the Assembly by the Chair of the Committee. This is made worse by the revelation that special schools and units are all oversubscribed. Surely this points to serious strategic failings in area planning. Uh, it is my understanding that the EA knew well in advance of June 2020 that these children needed to be catered for. So why, has there, why is this only happened? And why is it uh, so bad this particular year? I note from the from your response, Minister, to me on the 26th of June that the EA's extended act, uh, annual action plan specifically referenced North Belfast's need for additional learning support and autism-specific provision. 2020. I say again, this points to a serious strategic failure. So I make this point. I must add that I do not consider the shoehorning of children into schools using the ex extra numera rule that you referred to for statement of children uh, as an appropriate vehicle to solve this particular problem in this instance. Whilst I appreciate it is entirely complex, Minister, but I know the, the extra numera flexibility should not good planning, uh, and, and that's what the main issue is. That's an abuse of progress and adds to the concern that the committee has uh, stemming from education psychologists telling the Children's Commissioner that there are times when they are not permitted to state the full extent of the support a child requires on the statement. So what does the Department Minister intend that such a mess does not occur next year or ever again? And for that matter, uh, in the immediate future, the department needs to share its plan to cater for these children with this committee, preferably today or indeed very, very soon. I understand it's very complicated, Minister, but it is a big concern. I know other members of this committee have mentioned. Daniel, it's, it's, I, I, I entirely, entirely understand that. I know um, it's good to see you're in a more, more mellow mood in that regard. I don't know if sometimes in uh, radio programmes there's, there's an award for the... Um, Listeners furthest away from the from the centre, I suspect you're probably winning that winning that today. Look, it is it is a very significant problem. Um, it has been. I think this arises from um, the systemic failures within EA, which were highlighted, I think, in the uh, report, and will take some time to uh, correct. I think probably some of the progress on that has probably been slowed by the the COVID situation. Um, I think there's been probably an additional level of spike in terms of numbers of those uh, looking to transition this year. But you're right in terms of that's clear that that should be uh, foreseeable. I think principally when we're talking about um, locations, some can be within individuals, some can be, uh, call it sort of base unit solutions, which will be moving ahead. What I am indicating that, that while the primary responsibility lies with the EA, we've been working closely with them. And indeed, I think at the same time, uh, as last Thursday, I was, I was addressing the assembly in terms of the ad hoc. We had some of our officials yeah. meeting and discussing with, with EA. Now, there are a range of solutions which are being progressed in relation to that, I suppose, very much in the short term to make sure at least that, uh, that some of those children are, are, or those children are allocated. Um, that has, I think, within the space of a week, reduced that from 285 to 206. But we need to then to work within that. Now, what I would say in terms of the complexity of the situation, um, I suppose it's twofold. The ease of solutions um, is not as easy as, for example, within general mainstream um, schools, for example, because if you had, for instance, in West Tyrone, um, a spike in the number of children looking into, say, post-primaries in, in, in West Tyrone, which meant that, that um, the schools could then ask for a temporary variation. Clearly, for instance, if you're talking about children that are put into either a school or 
a particular specialist unit, uh, those unit numbers are rightly capped and can't therefore vary. So the, the, the opportunities are, there is a bit more inflexibility in the system um, uh, within that. What I would also indicate it's difficult to ascertain, there is always going to be some level, um, as again with, uh, with mainstream places, there will be a little bit of, of sort of call it friction around the margins because some of those numbers uh, will be on the basis of not necessarily where there is not a place for that child, but perhaps, and I know a few people have contacted me in relation to this, where a family uh, very much wanted a particular setting, a particular unit, and that unit is full. They've been offered maybe a place at a different unit and at this stage have not accepted it or have said they don't want that unit because it's not the one that, that they want. So there's always a little bit of, of issue around placement and that bit as well. But look, you're right in terms of um, there is the, the wider context of how we're dealing to make sure this, this doesn't happen in future years. That's why I think there's a programme board to which uh, senior officials of DE are directly involved with EA in that sort of um, recovery plan in terms of changing the systemic um, approach on special needs, in particular as regards, regards placement. I think there was a, um, a very clear cut and I think a very honest um, assessment that was done earlier this year in terms of the report that, that uh, was released. And I think as we, particularly as we move out of COVID, there will be, as with a lot of things, we'll be able to switch um, attention a lot more to uh, the problems that lie within education beyond simply COVID, and this is clearly one of them. Daniel there for a brief supplementary? No? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll try to bring you back in for a brief supplementary, Daniel, if you recover connectivity. In the meantime, can we move to Robbie Butler, MLA? Yeah, thank you. I'm in spotlight. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Minister. I will keep this very brief because um, you have made yourself available and I'm speaking with the teaching unions and seeing what you've been doing with um, with the pupils and even parents, it's good to see the level of uh, interactions you're having. Um, and last night was a late night. Um, and I just want to touch on something you, you talked about last night, which was slightly at odds with what we had heard from uh, the finance guy about two weeks ago, and it was in and around the reduction in the monies for mental health. So in the presentation that we had had from, from uh, the finance guy from your department, it was $5 million at the moment, but the, the other $5 million may well be bid for later on in the year. I think last night you had indicated, I don't know if it was if it was wrong or, or maybe just a slip of words that the five million was it for the year um could you give me some clarification no, on that no, I, think, I think i think robbie there, there isn't there isn't i mean look maybe just in terms of say misunderstanding of, of what i said look whenever i'm talking about it, like i almost trying to deal with what is very specifically within budget that, that's mm. not to say that there won't be a range of other things that we'll be bidding for but i'm not going to make promises on the basis of something that might come down the line at a later stage there's five million additional that has been put in and we'll be able to allocate within budget. We, we had put a bid, whenever the larger bid was put in in terms of finance of around about 426 million for this year, there was 10 million of that uh, was for additional mental health. Uh, but obviously we got uh, 226 million roughly, some of which um, even as well from the initial allocation, some of which have had to be diverted into additional pressures through, through COVID would probably about 200 million, I suppose, roughly speaking, left of the original uh, amount. But essentially, on that, that basis, then, as things were divided up, uh, I was able to get directly 5 million into that, about, um, about 50,000, I think, going to the, the contribution to the mental health champion side of it from the department. There's about half a million split between EA and youth service on youth service with particular interventions. EA curriculum side of things, building up resilience. And the other 4.45 million would be to look then at additional projects, pilots, particularly as it was focused in at the, uh, well, not exclusively, but particularly focused in particularly at the primary sector, who I think have probably in the past been a little bit of the Cinderella um, service in terms, of, um, in terms of mental health. I'm sure you'll agree. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm just to finish that out then, I, I tried to use the word catastrophization last night. We had a bit of a chuckle in the chamber and, and, I'm, and I'm not one to, to, to want to do that, with, especially with mental health, because we don't know what the outcomes are going to be for our young people. And yeah. I would just, obviously, you know, we'll be able to watch and breathe as a committee. I know you're committed to it yourself. But just for, for, for the final question, then, Chair, if it's OK, uh, the mental, uh, the wellbeing framework that has been sort of um, committed to by December, is that still on target, um, yeah. guys? Yes. 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 Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay.
Okay, I think it'd be great if that target was brought forward, but uh, appreciate that question, Robbie. Um, who do we still have with us now then? Catherine, Catherine. Catherine. Kelly? Uh, hold, sorry, hold on a second. Uh, but Daniel was momentarily back with us there again. Daniel, are you there for a very brief supplementary? Yes, uh, yep. sorry about that. No uh, problem. I'll go back to the telephone communicator next week instead of this thing. This is a go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Minister, uh, I'll not ask you to recap on some of those points, but I know I've made it. I'm just looking at uh, looking over the EA's governance statement for 2018 19. There is no hint of the serious problems now evident in SEN. Uh, why is this, and how can public bodies be held to account if their transparency is so lacking, uh, particularly on a serious issue? On reflection, does the Department have any plans to review its accountability mechanisms for its arm's length body? And finally, Minister, uh, uh, I, when I was scanning through the considerable uh, pack for this committee uh, last or this week, I had noticed that there was references made to bonus-related pay for all senior directors in EA that has continued this year and last, which I do not think the public will find acceptable given what how uh, the SEN situation has been managed by EA. Can you make any comment on that, Minister? Thank you. I don't know the detail of bonus payments. Oh, sorry, well, with, look, Daniel, as regards to any issue of the bonus, we'll just need to look into that and get you back with, with detail. I mean, obviously, in terms of the stuff with 1819, there has clearly been, I mean, first of all, that is effectively, previous it's a previous year's bit, so it's in, in connection. Mm -hmm. There's clearly been systemic problems with SEN. That's why there was um, the uh, the report that was done into the issue, why it came up with the range of recommendations. Uh, and I think, to be fair, there was some concern at the time that whenever that was initiated, there was a danger of, you know, some people raised concern, would this be a level of whitewash? In that regard, very clearly, that, that identified the systemic problems and produced um, a route for, for solutions. And we're making sure that those are, are brought into effect. What? Quick point, Daniel, if I can add, I mean, you talk yeah, about governance. Good. Obviously, there are many things going on in SEN, and we are concerned about them. We yeah. have an audit office report in gestation. We have the Children Commissioner's report. We have the EA's own report. They have the, we have the work that we have done, and which obviously the Minister will want to bring to fruition on a new code of statutory code of practice and engage with the committee on that. Um, on governance, the Minister just agreed uh, that I should now chair an overarching steering group on all of those pieces to bring them together, to tie them together, to make sure that all of the implementation plans and all of the recommendations can be drawn together, if you like, into a single coherent implementation plan to drive this forward. Okay. Now, you might say that's too little, too late. Yeah. It's what we're doing now. I am going to directly get involved even though a lot of these issues statutorily do not rest with the department, mm. such as our concern for it. And Sarah, Sarah Long, the chief executive, is fully in agreement with that, and I discussed it with her earlier in the week. Well, that, that is welcome, Derek, and I do appreciate uh, that level of intervention from yourselves, because I think it's important that we instill confidence from the public's point of view in yeah. terms of this overarching issue. And Minister, the same time, I know I know that you realise how serious this issue is and how quickly it must be addressed because there's vulnerable children involved. But what, what I will say, and I, I know, Minister, you haven't got the details in front of you, but I know that you'll be as appalled at this as I am when I read the details. Given this, the, the huge crisis facing SEN under the management of the directors of EA, I, I just find it appalling that they've received a bonus-related pay uh, increase uh, over the course of the last two years, given what has been revealed, particularly in the last six months, and I, I don't expect you have answers on that today, but uh, I know you're looking yeah, at and, and, uh, and I'm, not, I'm not Daniel at the stage just aware of the details. Yeah, I appreciate that. that. Yeah. Okay. okay, and thank you, Derek. I appreciate that intervention as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dan. Minister, Permanent Secretary. You, you say that some of these issues are issues for which you don't have statutory responsibility, but to be clear, you have statutory responsibility for area planning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And one of the most significant systemic feelings in the system is around area planning for special schools. Right. Yeah, can I, can I sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. That up? yeah, I mean, I agree with you entirely, um, Chair, that the issue of area planning for special schools is an issue that should have been dealt with before now. Fully accept that. 
We have been waiting for a plan to come forward from the Education Authority for some time, particularly in the Belfast area, and been pressing them on that. And actually, I think the issue has very recently been considered by the Education Authority. So we await receipt of that with interest. Um, I, you know, when I said we didn't have statutory authority, ultimately we have authority and responsibility for everything, and I fully accept that. That wasn't an attempt to abrogate responsibility in any way whatsoever. What I was talking about was the placement of individual children. There's lots of things we cannot intervene in because we would only get in the way and we don't have the capacity or the expertise. I fully accept that we have responsibility for everything to do with education policy and that is why I personally am intervening in the overarching aspect of special education needs and drawing all of those threads together in a strategic way. I appreciate that response, Derek. And the Minister, you'd given a helpful update with regards to the unplace uh, statement of children earlier in your remarks. Is it possible to go into the detail of how many of the 157 special school pupils um, remain unplaced in special schools? Don't, don't think we've, um, Chair, I don't, I don't think we've just that direct detail Okay. To have, but look, we'll, we'll get that to the committee okay. ASAP. Fair, fair enough. In terms of the breakdown of that, we, we've got the global figure at 206, but is there. 285 two, two, two was how many yeah. were last week. That's Hold on a second. At 206. Hold on a second. I think of the, the special school pupils. We, in terms of sorry, special school placements, we believe that it's uh, the unplaced ones are 110, but look, we'll get, we'll, we'll confirm that, that up just, okay, and, just to make sure we're not yeah, misleading. And I think, I think the, the breakdown. Seven, so okay, thank you. Yeah, and I think the break the breakdown of that, I think, on the hundred and ten would be um, eighty five at primary level and twenty five at, at post primary level. Okay, thank you, Minister. Can I bring in Catherine Kelly? Is Catherine there? She is. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Chair, um, and thank you, Peter, Derek, and John, for meeting with us again today. Um, my question is in relation to the allocation of the ten and a half million that was announced yesterday by the Finance Minister. Is there any further information on how this will be allocated? Um, and are you aware of a timeline or anything as to yeah, when yeah, yeah. owners should expect to receive yeah. support? Catherine, we're obviously, we couldn't do, well, there's been a bit of preparatory work. We couldn't do anything absolutely definitive until we got clear that the money was, was coming. But we're working on the detail of how best this should be implemented with the, the reference group. So we should be in a position, I think, relatively soon to do that. We want to make sure then that whatever is there is fit for purpose. And obviously, as part of that, uh, I suppose one wouldn't say additional restriction, but one of the, the broader elements of this is also the fact that uh, obviously when it comes to childcare, we have a policy route health. It's not something which just entirely lies with it. You know, we work with the reference group. It's not necessarily it will be cross departmental in its, in its nature. But I, but yeah. I think I think the general point about making sure no. Yeah, can I just follow up, Catherine? As the minister says, we're in a different. The focus, as the minister said earlier, is not on supporting those settings that are closed, but focusing on getting settings open and supporting them with the financial viability problems they'll face. So we're working with the reference group on that to see what is appropriate. An important point. Well, it's a significant point for us. Um, we are really, really grateful to Business Services Organisation for administering the grant aid scheme to date, but they unfortunately will not have the capacity to do that going forward. So we will have an alternative administrative arrangement in place to administer the new grant scheme. And we're just finalising the details of that and we let the committee know as soon as possible. But we're working with the minister on that, so I don't want to preempt ministerial decisions. Thanks for that. And then just one further um, question, and it is in relation to the summer provision uh, for vulnerable children and young people and children with special needs. Yeah, uh, where we are at, Catherine, with that, and I think some of these are, are moving ahead. I think under, call it a normal summer, I think there's normally 21 um, schools that, that would normally be involved. I think at this stage we understand there's 17 out of the 21 will be directly involved. And as part of that, the provision uh, will be a mixture of morning school, um, school based activities supplemented by afternoon online uh, provision. 
and I think there's I think there's three of the schools have only got online provision, but the rest will also be directly involved uh, with that. It's not quite the same nature as what was there before, but I think is is moving much closer to what uh, the level of provision that that uh, uh, that is normally available. Is there a time frame or anything for when it will actually um, happen? When the schools will be, will be yeah. working. I think look, I think from that point of view, Catherine, it's, it'll be a steady rolling program, but I think some are opening some are opening this week in relation to that. So some of that's been rolled out uh, pretty quickly in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Catherine. Justin McNulty. Final question, Minister. Thank you. Good job. Justin. Um, there you go. It's good to see you, Sean. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Justin. I do have to say, this is like this is like feeling of Eurovision about about this. So I don't know if this is the votes from the Stockholm jury coming in. <laughs> do you I want me to sing a song? I know. I was about to say, Justin, as long as you don't <laughs> sing, I think we'll be all right. Go ahead, Justin. <laughs> think, think, things have at times been unprecedented and sometimes desperate, but we've not quite reached that level, Justin, just yet. <laughs> He might be a good singer, who knows? Go ahead, Justin. Oh, well, who knows? Who knows, yeah. Brilliant. Um, good to see you, gentlemen, showing a good example of social distancing. Um, very important issue was raised this morning with the, the group um, who um, highlighted the issue of the NSPC's uh, schools service who raised concerns in relation to the many children who have been left to suffer in silence due to the incidents of abuse going unreported due to school closure at this time, and it's not been picked up by trained staff because they don't have the visibility of the queues that they normally would have. And my question is, and I've raised this multiple times with you guys already, and I'm not, I'm not dropping it. I want to know what is the Department of Education doing proactively in an effort to ensure no child is safe, is unsafe in their own home? Child protection well, arrangements exist. Yeah, I mean, all the existing, I mean, the, the all the existing childcare arrangements uh, exist. We've been working closely with social services. Indeed, we also went the, the extra mile of trying to contact, of contacting schools so that they could also act, albeit sort of not um, not directly, but from their knowledge of where they felt that there would be certain levels of, of families and children at risk. So we've been coordinating in terms with social services. All the, all the current existing services are there. Now, I think there's a wider concern which will become clearer whenever lockdown eases is the extent to which there may well be some families out there which nobody it has not passed the attention of anybody um, up until now at any stage that there's a particular problem some problems will have arisen and be exacerbated by, by lockdown so there's no doubt there is a a problem there but I think everything that it has been done can be done but it, it also I think maybe highlights on a different sphere the, the need to get children back directly into school and yeah. get that level of contact, yeah. you know, in connection with that. But um, there is no system by its nature that is going to be so watertight that it will ensure that every single child, um, that you can give a guarantee that, that every single child uh, will be safe. In the same way, under normal times, there is no system which can be absolutely watertight to the extent of guaranteeing that, that there won't be something whenever a door is closed in a house that nobody knows about outside of that household. Yeah, that's frightening. I know you've referred to existing services. Existing services don't don't really cut it at the time. Um, this is a new period of time for so many kids and families. And I just think that the Department of Education should be more proactive in reaching out to families and children in some manner or form to ensure, to try to ensure. I know there's no feel safe mechanism, but I think it's something that the department should be very proactive about trying to help ensure there are no kids there. I think, I think, look, I think, I think Justin, we have been as proactive as, as we can be. I suppose part of the complication, if we are talking about at-risk or abuse situations, yeah. now clearly, for starters, in terms of, um, and again, this has been something that's been cross-jurisdictional, we focused in, in trying to provide places, particularly for vulnerable children in relation to that. Part of, I suppose, the danger of... Um, or the, the limitations to some extent sometimes in, in reaching out is if you're getting a family where some level of abuse is taking place within that family, they're not necessarily going to then turn around and say, actually, we are in a problem situation. We're, we're there. You know, there's as much reaching out as, as can possibly happen. But I think it would be naive in all our parts to think that, 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 that anything that can be done is in every case going to be able to, 
to spot a problem and, and solve a problem. I think the maximum that, that can be done, there's been a, a level across, particularly in the early days of Cronus, a level of um, general restrictions to the extent to which professionals can enter homes, they can take those particular levels of action, but there isn't the same level of interaction within the broader community either in terms of being able to spot where there, there are problems um, in connection to that. But like, all the services are still there. They are still moving ahead um, to the extent that they were they were before. And I just, I suppose from a practical point of view, beyond what's being done, it's difficult to see whether there's a particular action that, that, that can be taken uh, by ourselves or by health or others. Okay, well, I think it's important on the, the return to school program that there's major flagging done, a major emphasis put on identifying it where there may have been issues. Yeah. Emphasis on health and well-being. And health and well-being are, are highlighted very clearly within the, the guidance in relation to that. So, yeah, it is, it is something, and there will be, I suspect there will be problems uncovered whenever we see returns that were not known prior to March. And I think that, that is going to be inevitable. And we will see, I think, some very sad examples uh, as well. In many cases, I think there will be a lot of resilience from children, but there will be cases that will come to light, uh, I have no doubt, um, which will be very worrying and, and obviously will need action taken on. Yeah, that's sad and scary. Minister, um, you will ensure that there are um, appropriate resources there to address all these issues that may come to light yeah, when we start yeah, happening. There is, there is. There is this part of that, and it's again working particularly in conjunction with social services, particularly that mainly lie under, most of those will lie under health, but obviously we'll coordinate with uh, with all the agencies in relation to that. Okay, thank you, Minister. In terms of blended learning, which will obviously be necessary on the return of schools, um, and the success of that will be dictated by the availability of appropriate ICT. Um, Julie Head is telling me current results are out of date and funding has been totally inadequate. Will substantial additional investment be put in place? What is happening with the current CJPA contract? I, 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 would, I would disagree that it's been uh, inadequate. Look, there will be, if it's an issue of broadband provision, that largely lies to some extent outside um, our remit. But we've ruled out, particularly in terms of the digital devices, um, we're in, I suppose, in the position of phase two, where I think around about 3,600 through EA directly in addition to the phase one have been made available. I think the assessment of the need is probably still a gap of about 1,200 in relation to that. But we have, we've obviously committed then to purchasing additional, division, additional devices as well so that we can be in a position that come September where that's needed, that will be able to be, to be covered. But if, committee, excuse me, sorry, I have to, I have to leave at this, at this stage on it, but I know you're kind of coming to a conclusion anyway, but I There's wish you... That. I'll give you a bit of a laugh as well. It was an important point to make, Minister. I remember my first day at school. Um, myself, my twin brother, my mum and dad thought it would be a nice surprise for springing us into school. There's no prep, no no pre-visits or anything. They just dropped us off. And myself, my twin brother went buck mad. <laughs> and we were quickly, quickly ejected and we had to be brought home. And I remember my dad pulled the school bags back in the house and said, take them to efforts and the, the laugh around that for memory though, right? But I, I'm deeply worried, Justin, that the, I'm deeply worried the prospect of a, a Justin McNulty clone is out there as well. I think <laughs> yeah. one, of you, one of you is bad enough the idea, the idea of, of a twin as well. With my, my, my nightmares will be haunted tonight uh, in relation to that on it, but folks are better. I have a very happy, very happy upbringing, but just making the point based on the fact that the return to school guidance is going to create a lot of confusion and uncertainty for parents and pupils. The staggered start times, finish times, no school bags, no hit, no lunch boxes, clean, uh, different uniforms every day, social bubbles, strict social bubbles, staggered break and lunch times, attending, to, attending school two days a week, blended learning and home school learning, no guidance on, if, on whether kids can wear coats or not. This is going to create major uncertainty and, and almost a state of chaos between, amongst kids and families and parents and teachers. What's, what's I think, give them I think, I think the idea, I, I think to be fair, Justin, I think this is, this is to try and give as comprehensive an advice yeah. as possible. Now, if you're going to arrange those issues into further levels of detail, there is a danger that you get into war and peace and you get yeah. a situation that, that is lengthy. But, sorry, folks, I'll, I'll leave you with the, the yeah. thank, Permanent thank Secretary and Deputy Prime Minister. Justin, uh, we, we have a bit of business ourselves to rattle through here as well. So, uh, Deputy Sec uh, Permanent Secretary, Deputy Permanent Secretary, thank you as well for your thank briefing today. Good evening. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Justin. If I could bring the clerk in just to summarise actions, thank you. So, Chair of Asta Assembly Broadcasting, just to bring members uh, back into the spotlight again. So, we have a couple of bits of uh, bits and pieces in the pack. So, at page 341, this is the table which shows the outstanding departmental correspondence. So, this is where I think we are with this, what I reckon is closed. And I think we are just on our quorum, as we seem to have lost Robbie. Um, yeah. One, no, no, he's still three, there, four, but five, just, just can't see no, him. We're still there, yeah. If, right. if members could bear with us just for 10 no. or 15 minutes, okay? Thank you. I go, okay, no, we're okay. We've got Robbie. So, page 341, it's this big table, shows all the correspondence we've got, what I think. Uh, so, the department tends to answer through the sit rep, which isn't ideal. So, are members content with what I've written there and do they think it's accurate? The stuff in red is basically that which I think is still outstanding. Thank you. Agreed. Is that agreed? We're fine, yeah. Agreed, thanks. Okay, then moving on then, at page 381, we have an email from a school principal on the use of remote <laughs> devices. Um, can I ask, Chairperson, if members are content to um, write back, uh, as we ordinarily would anyway, but indicating that the committee has scrutinised the department's use of technology, talked a bit about it today, particularly for deprived and vulnerable children in transition years, um, and uh, but indicate that the department has told us that it's their understanding that the costs and logistics of extending this support to all children would actually be quite um, significant. Uh, so like the 8,000 or so um, uh, laptops and things which are being lent out, they're really just for transition years and indeed for those children who are um, deprived or vulnerable. So yeah, can Clark, I, I agreed members. Um, uh, Clark, I don't know if you'll cover this in other action items, but um, we, is it possible for the committee to write to the department to ask what plans it has to upscale the uh, provision of training, teacher training for remote learning and device provision, given blended learning rests on those two two things? Members content with that? Agreed? Okay. Agreed. Members say agreed. Agreed. I just think agreed. Agreed. Uh, in terms of that, you also want to write to the department and ask them about their plans to make a virtual learning environment and access to Canvas, etc., um, uh, available to teachers to help them to devise these uh, you know, blended learning um, lessons, etc. Agreed. Yeah, just on the last point, parents as well. Say again. Oh, yeah, include parents. Yeah, fair point. Sorry, yep. what, what was that? Uh, so, training for teachers and parents yeah. in. Okay. Remote learning and early years play was a point raised today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll ask all of that. Jolly yeah. good, right, very good. And then uh, at page three hundred and eighty-two, uh, correspondence from Cena G about the COVID nineteen issues facing the Irish medium sector, and they're offering the they're inviting the committee to visit an, an Irish medium school. Um, a committee is the committee content to agree to this? Um, maybe in the autumn with uh, public health considerations uh, or different. Yep. Agreed. 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 And look, if members have a suggestion for an Irish medium school, I mean, Synergy will probably suggest one, but if members have one in mind, then we do that. Um, also, at page 385, there's correspondence from the Royal Society of Biology on the impact of COVID-19 on bioscience education in Northern Ireland. So, Chair, could I ask the committee's agreement to write to SIA and just seek clarity on the guidance that's going to issue to schools re-practical inquiry-based learning? when schools do actually restart. Yeah. Can I, members, just remind you all that, that you, you're all audible now. We can hear all of you, okay, no problem. Just, just a reminder. Um, Clark, as well, can I take us back, just that previous correspondence from the Irish uh, medium sector. Is it possible for us to forward the uh, paper they uh, provided us with in regards to their concerns and to seek uh, provide that to the department and seek a response from the department in relation to those concerns. Okay, yeah. Members agreed? Agreed, mm -hmm. okay. thanks. So yes, right, right. Thanks. okay then. And then uh, there's a submission from Unite, the uh, registered child banders branch at page 388. They want to give oral evidence to the committee. They provided us with a paper. Um, perhaps, Chairperson, we are going to meet informally on Tuesday, so, sorry, Monday, Monday, um, so three o'clock was going to be parent kind. So two o'clock could be unite if that would work for members. So that would be a bit of a long session on Monday afternoon. But would that I, it, it, it is long, but I agree they are they are important issues. Um, or members, sure. yes. Just be aware, there's a sitting of the assembly next Monday. Um, there's two sitting next week, so things have changed. 
right. Yeah. The member's that absolutely is right. Correct. We may need to adjust that. Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure that it's going to make it awkward even for the one. You're right, actually, Chairperson. Yeah, it, it, it may do. Um, we're content for the clerk and I to review that and to come back to yeah. you. Is that and, fair and That's okay. And both of them, both the parent kind and Unite. I mean, yeah, two, two o'clock is question time. Um, uh, is there oh, a sorry, there be, right, Chair, there won't be any question time, no. It's just assembly plenary business. So it's assembly plenary business. Now, there's the, the, the business at the minute is, is sort of stacking up to about half four or five o'clock. Obviously, if there's any executive business comes forward, it will extend. But yeah, there's a, there's a full day of business even without question time at the moment. Okay. How, how urgent are those two presentations in terms of timing? Because we're heading into the suspension of the actual assembly. So uh, is it possible to delay it a week? Yeah, or, or well, maybe even later in that what, 9th or 10th of July even? Uh, well, no, because no. Um, uh, staff will be on leave, uh, okay. so no, we won't. So okay. our last meeting will be yeah. the 8th of July, and um, we'll be then basically doing all the things that we need to do on the, yeah. uh, the 9th and the 10th. Okay. Um, so um, I, th I think, I think we're going to have to... I think we're going to have to consult the assembly plenary schedule just to see whether there is a way to navigate around that. But we'll okay. we'll come back to members via email if you can watch out for that. Okay. Agreed. Agreed. And that's, okay. Thanks. And that's that. I think the other things that actually members were asking around the the two hundred eighty five children we have an answer on that, and also around the uh, perhaps uh, right to the department seeking the terms of reference of this steering group yeah. uh, on SEN. I imagine we're going to get this anyway in the because we wrote to the department last week about SEN matters. And just to just to come back to uh, Mr. McCrossan that um, the what, what's in correspondence, we'll come to it in a minute, is the Education Authority annual report from la, not last year, but the year before. So that, that, it's a long time. I know looking at it, you'd think it would be 1920, but it's not. It's 1890. <laughs> Uh, uh, sorry for cutting fast. I checked that since and I realised that I'm on dates. But uh, I would have every. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but um, not, not I would assume, Chair, that judging that they took it in 17, 18, 18 19, that in 1920 they'd expect the same. And if that's the case, then they have serious questions to answer, particularly with what's been revealed. Yes. Okay. Agreed. Um, okay. Five thousand pounds per head they've got, by the way. It's not like money. They're not getting 500, 5,000 pounds per head. Mm. A bonus pay performance. I'd love to know who's reviewing the performance. It, it, it's a fair question, yeah. I mean, can, can we write to the department to ask that, Clark? Yeah. About, so what are we writing to the department? Well, we're, we're writing to ask, seek confirmation of the award of bonuses. Who who reviewed, who, who awarded the bonuses and who, who reviews that award given the uh, the circumstances that have pertained? Yeah. Well, so we're asking, we're asking we're about 1920. Private conversation, isn't it? Pardon? Say again. Uh, no one else can hear us apart from the committee members, isn't that right? No, 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 we're, no we're broadcasting. We're audible, we're audible, we're broadcasting. broadcasting. Okay, well, we're broadcasting. Yeah, okay. Good job, I asked that question. <laughs> so okay. we're writing to the department, we're asking about 1920 and whether there were, given what we now know, what the committee now knows about um, saying whether there is going to be the awarding of bonuses to uh, directors. Yes, yes. Okay. members agreed. Great. Agreed, thank you. Great. Marvellous. That's grand. Okay. Correspondence, Clark. Lovely. Yeah. So, members, um, yeah, a uh, couple of things of correspondence. So, at page 395, uh, this is from Parentkind. Um, so, they wanted to come on Monday at 3 pm to talk through their survey and their findings. So, I think the previous action applies. We'll yeah. see Clark, what can be I, done. Is, am I right to understand then we have Parentkind mm -hmm. Unite and the Children's mm -hmm. Law Centre? Um, potentially for mm -hmm. informal meetings and we'll just have to review when we can do those. I think the yeah. Children's Law Centre, I would suggest you put that one off to the autumn because um, that would be, they would be very interesting to talk about the SEND framework. Informal session, okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so, uh, so that would be that. Would be that. Um, so uh, at page 399, there's a response from DE on Nikki's report into SEND improvement in mainstream schools. Um, the department hasn't provided any detail on the time scale for the framework again or the role of RQIA in this. Um, it's just a reminder that the framework's been around for a while. The Act was passed in 2016, uh, so they aren't able to answer that question. But perhaps the committee wishes to return to this when we look at the SEND uh, framework and the SEND consultation uh, in the next session. Agreed. 
Agreed. Yeah. Member still? Agreed. Member still? Thank you. Uh, sorry, at page 403 and 407, we've responses from Nipso and Nikki about the review of um, restrictive practices, restraint and seclusion. So um, Nikki is going to do some work on this in uh, 2021. Uh, we've already got the British Association of Social Workers who will come to talk to us in the autumn about this subject. Just note that Nikki indicates that they were, they've got a survey and they're not going to launch it. In fact, they're not even going to launch it in September because they, they think that uh, schools may be distracted. But we can come back to that um, uh, next week. Um, but just in terms of the issue of uh, restrictive practice, restraint and seclusion, members contend just to hold on to this until the British Association of Social Workers comes to brief in the next session. Yeah, um, I, yeah just uh, and to be clear, that will remain a priority for the committee. Um, and obviously with the evidence session with the British Association of Social Workers lined up for the autumn, we will do that. Um, it's my understanding that there may be an appointment in relation to NIPSO in the near future, so um, it may be possible for us to um, return to that as, sooner, as soon as possible. Are, are members content with that for now? Agreed? agreed. Yep, agreed. Yeah, okay, agreed. thanks, Clark. Okay, uh, sorry, at uh, page 411, you've got a copy of the Education Authority Annual Report and Accounts, that's 1819. So, look, usually we would get these sorts of things. Um, these kind of annual report and accounts, as you can see others, um, about this time of year for the year that's just passed. The Education Authority, this is really late. It's always been late. I think actually to be fair to them, it's a couple of months earlier than we normally get it, but it's still a year out of date. It's just for members to note that for now, and I'm sure that uh, they will um, return to the Education Authority again uh, in the next session if members are content just to note for now. Okay. Agreed. Agreed. And then, and then we have um, the shared education report at page 563. Um, this is something the department's obliged to lodge every two years. We had lined up the department to come up and talk about this, but then COVID came along to uh, interrupt that. So again, if we note for now, return to it in the next session. Third person. Agreed. One member say. Agreed. Thank you. And then finally, Children's Law Centre as the Chair just mentioned, maybe if you return, they, they want, that's at page 644. They want to come and brief the committee, but I'd suggest that we arrange that uh, in the uh, autumn. They're a very useful organisation. The committee's got a lot of use out of them um, over the years, and I hope that the members have actually already. If, uh, so yeah, Clark, just this, or if maybe if members could agree that, and I'll just ask a supplementary action in relation to CLC. Member, members content to invite them to brief the committee in the autumn, agreed? Agreed. 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 Clark, if, if members are content, I'm content to meet with the Children's Law Centre in the interim uh, in case there's any issues of urgency um, and um, invite any of the members who wish to accompany me as well then, if, if members are content with that. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, yep. thank you. Okay. So forward work program. I okay, members agenda item eight forward work program on page six five one. Can I remind members there will now be three oral briefings on the eighth of July. No, and there won't. There won't. <laughs> so Mark, do you want to speak to next week's briefing? So <laughs> okay. uh, I, I assumed uh, that we might have. Um, um, okay, no so eighth of July. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be action packed on the eighth of July. It always is. So it'll be the National Children's Bureau talking about the emotional health and wellbeing framework. So just that members understand what that is, that's their report, uh, which then informed the department's uh, consideration of this policy issue. Yep. They're not coming to talk about the framework, they're yep. coming to talk about what they said should go into it. Yep. And it's just that it provides background. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have the department, the sort of final um, uh, session with the department about uh, COVID matters. So that maybe we might take a little bit more time to talk about the post-primary transfer survey and maybe we sorry sorry daniel i think you're still on daniel we we can hear you okay uh, sorry uh so okay. that maybe we start at nine o'clock then on um for the last time hopefully on the 8th of july and then um as i say do those three things which will be national children's bureau department and talk about the post-primary transfer survey okay okay jolly good uh do you want to speak to Okay. Third point there. Right then, members. So normally, if you look at that forward work program, which is at page six five one, there's very little in it. Um, usually, at this stage of the game, I would have this booked out till Halloween. Now, obviously, members could change and 
do whatever they want to do, but I would have this well booked out. Don't have that yet, because I'm not sure what, what we're going to be doing in September. Um, I think by the time we get to when we're going to meet in August, the public health situation will be clearer, hopefully a lot better. Maybe we'll be meeting in normal session again and perhaps dealing with them um, with other matters other than COVID-19 as we've already started to do. So what I could ask, Chairperson, is that members have a bit of a think between now and next week. We have a big long list of things to be scheduled. Um, pick out the things that you maybe want to do most urgently and uh, I'll then preliminarily schedule those um, for September, October, and then we can have another chat about it anyway in August and maybe have a strategic planning session at the start of September. Thanks. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Okay. Any other business members? Just a quick one, Chris. In terms of various medium and schools to potentially visit, uh, could you punch goal in your... Just put that on the list, please. Okay. I'm Thank sure. you, Justin. Any other business members? Uh, just, um, uh, Chair, uh, I'm just looking for some clarification around what's going to happen when the actual assembly goes into recess. Is this committee going to continue functioning or not? So my, my understanding is that the uh, assembly has potential to sit during July. Um, and I think there may be a short uh, recess at the start of August with the option of returning to the circumstances require. Um, we're taking a, a similar approach in that we're obviously meet, meeting next week um, and um, we are, we're scheduled to return on August the 17th. It's the, is that right? Yeah, so the, the plan will be, uh, Chairperson members, is that um, the, uh, there is the potential for plenaries on the week commencing the 17th of July or the 20th of July. Um, but that there aren't planned plenaries for August, but the ad hoc committee could meet and could meet at any time. Um, so that the idea would be our last uh, meeting uh, for this session would be 8th of July, which is summer recess. And then we would meet again on the week commencing 17th of August. I'd like it to be a Thursday. So if members of we think about that, it just gives me about two days uh, rather than one day um, to write some papers uh, for whenever we do come back. Um, so the idea would be uh, on, you can see on that forward work programme, on that date, we would ask CA to come along and tell us how the A-levels went and also ask the department to come along and ask us how, how restart's going because uh, things should be, that would be a week before the schools come back and a few days after the A-level results come out. And then as I say, in September, we could have a strategic planning session when maybe the committee's focus might be a lot less um, COVID related, maybe a lot of restart to begin with but then a lot less COVID related as we go on and uh, if members of uh, a notion or a, you know, they want to do an inquiry that will be the time to um, sort of think about the terms of reference because we will have less than two years of the mandate left. Chair, sure. uh, just a, a, a final point as well and I don't want to take up any more time because people have been on this quite a, quite a length this morning but See, in relation to the committee packs and the table papers, now I understand they're quite extensive and rightly so, given that there's some considerable challenges to be considered by this committee. But in the table papers, there's quite a lot of duplication carried over from the previous week. Now, I know that's helpful to an extent, but it just means that I'm still siphoning through. We're still siphoning through everything. If the table papers could become an update from the previous week instead of including, I think it would be much more helpful to ensure that we can swiftly uh, get to the point and get to the detail of it. It's not a criticism, it's just an, a, an observation. Just to advise the member, I'd, I'd stop doing that. Um, what we had done was, um, this is the, the, the SIP rep, which is now about 150 pages long. Uh, I used to put it in the meeting pack and then put the updated version in the table papers. Don't do that anymore. So what you've got in the your meeting pack is a note from me basically saying, um, uh, updating on the, it's like a six page note which updates on everything that's in the sit rep that has changed. And then in the table papers, you actually get the sit rep. I only get it from them on Tuesday. So that's why it goes into table papers. So there should not be any duplication. Packs were really long this week because I put in that Education Authority uh, annual report. And um, it's just, it's an unusual, I didn't expect to get it, but I thought members might be interested in it. Uh, Peter, we appreciate the work that you and your colleagues do to ensure that we uh, are in a strong position to scrutinise the various issues facing education and, we, we, and the work of the Department DA and others. We do appreciate that. It's just a, a, a terrible habit, just trying to get straight to the 
scrutiny that over the issue to speed things up, particularly when you take last night we were in the assembly quite late yeah. uh, as an example of it. But no, thank you very much for all your work and continued efforts in supporting us, Peter. We do appreciate it very much. I think members you might want to give a thought about how we would like to go forward in August. I, uh, the department is very good about coming along and there's a lot of information in the sit rep, but I think sometimes um, you know, stuff gets lost in there. It's so long, there's so much to read. Uh, it stuff gets lost, and I would really like I would like to go back to a more normal department briefs. This we write letters, they answer the letters, so we can know that we've had answers to questions. But that's for members to decide. Have a wee think about that, if you would, chairperson. Members. Okay. Thank you, Clark. Members, content. Yep. Okay. Members, our our, our next meeting then will be Wednesday, the eighth of July, in room twenty nine, Parliament Buildings, or via Starleaf at nine a.m. Thank you. Meeting is now adjourned. Thanks, Thanks. members. Thank you. Assembly, committee room 29.